Go ahead, Sanjay. Okay, so uh, hopefully the slides are visible. Right? Yes. Okay. All right. So um, what I want to do first is is you know and and what I realize is that everyone who comes to these these discussions has not necessarily seen or or understand all of the ideas that I talk about. There are a lot of ideas that I've talked about. We've been doing this for I think a year and a half almost. Um, it's quite a while. Um, and so there are a lot of ideas that that I presented and, and you know people have, have read on their own. But some of these ideas are essential, especially for, for uh, this evening's uh, talk. Um, so I'm going to go through some of those in the beginning um, just to make sure that that uh, but these are not low level. I mean, there, there's some ideas that are very low level that I think everybody should have a, somewhat of a grasp of. I won't start at the basics, but these are some of the mid-level ideas that I think are important. So things about neurons, the fact that neurons exist in the brain, um, you know, the, the brain has uh, many different types of other cells. There are a lot of other ideas that I've presented. The, the fact that, that the brain is compartmentalized, how it developed over time, those aspects I'm not going to go into. Um, so these are ideas specific to the topic for tonight that I think are essential, although these you know, help people in general. So one, one idea is that um, the brain, and what, what I'm, when I mean brain, I'm talking more or less about um, all mammals. Um, and many of the things that I talk about, especially when I get into the, I'll, I'll go into something called a network uh, to a you know, second uh, uh, part of this. Um, and the network applies not only to mammals, it applies to basically everything that has a brain, um, from the smallest insects to, um, you know, uh, uh, octopus, uh, any type of living uh, thing that has a uh, neuronal brain. Um, you know, plants do not, but any kind of animal or insect, um, it applies to. But, you know, a lot of the, the more uh, complicated ideas apply mainly to, to, to mammals, and I'll try to differentiate those. So this segment about regions applies specifically to mammals and more complex animals. The smaller, you know, insects and things don't have necessarily very many regions, they, their brain might consist of one region at most. So in that sense, it still applies, but but this is really geared around multiple regions of the brain. So the first idea is that um, our brain, especially mammal brain and human, uh, you know, primate brains, are they're split into partialized into uh, regions. And the word region actually, I'll, you know, I'll describe that a little bit, but it's it's a it's a vague word. It, but there are actually many words that are used in in the scientific community, but a region is is a simple word that most people understand. So each region provides specialized function. That's important to understand. Examples of these are um, vision, uh, muscle activation. So vision would be in the in the occipital lobe. Muscle activation would be in the uh, the frontal lobe. Um, language would be in the, the temporal lobe and, and the parietal lobe. So language is something that, that that's uh, unique. So Anyway, these three three regions, there are many, many regions. So there's another region that, that handles sleep regulation. It's actually part of the brain stem. Uh, the uh, a part of the brain that most people aren't familiar with or don't think about when they think of the brain is the cerebellum. That, that's responsible for a lot of our balancing um, and our body position and things like that. So there are many, many regions within primate and human brains, as well as most mammalian brains. Um, now, one of the things that happened um, is over time, um, the, the, there were several scientists who tried to come up with more formal techniques to try to um, identify specific regions in, in, let's say, the human brain. Okay? And what they actually did is they, they did this across species. So, um, you know, there was a, in, in 1909, there was a, a scientist, he's, he's actually an anatomist, um, Broadman. He came up with his own uh, categorization. Of, of human brains. And he initially came up with 52 unique areas. And excuse me, today they're, they're known as Broadman areas, Broadman's areas. And over time, that number actually changed. So today it's considered more 43 because some of those areas seem to be doing the same thing. So they were combined. So that's that's early in, in uh, the history of neuroscience. This happened where this was a formal way of, of identifying specific regions of the brain um, in the sense that each of these regions were uh, responsible for a specialized function, for example, you know, vision or, or sleep regulation, et cetera. Um, although Broadman's area is, is specific to only the, the cortex, the, uh, the uh, um, uh, you know, the, the, when people think of the brain, it's the main part of the brain, not the brain stem, not the limbic system. Those areas are uh, not considered part of Broadman's areas. 
And then after that, there was another um, effort, and this effort actually was more recently uh, completed. It's actually been going on for almost 10 years. And there are two groups, a US team and a European team, and they both completed last their, their efforts last year. And what they did is they found, they, they reclassified the brain in much more detail using more sophisticated tools. This is 21st century. Broadman did it in, the, in the, the 20th century, very early in the 20th century. So he really had 19th century tools. It was much more primitive, you know, over 100 years ago. Um, so this new te these new teams um, came up with very advanced um, uh, images, uh, not images, uh, uh, topology, maps of, of the human brain. Um, and they, they compartmentalized it, parcelated it into uh, one team came up to, I think it was 178 uh, seg uh, regions. Another team came up to around 250 regions. So these these are pretty, um, you know, detailed maps of the of the brain. Um, now another aspect to, to to understand here is that these regions um, are not uh, homologous; they're not identical in every person. Okay, in general, so every person has the same region. So let's say if we think about it as 250 regions in, in the brain, you know, as, as one of the recent uh, um, uh, surveys found um, everybody will have all 250 of those regions but the characteristics of, of let's say one of those regions the region that's responsible for uh, muscle activation um, that region will vary from person to person and it can vary in many many different ways so for example the shape of the region the size of it um, the depth um, so some of you may remember that the brain is actually in multiple layers especially the cortex is in six layers so the, the depth or in the number of millimeters that these that a particular region is um, that can vary from person to person the mass you know meaning the number of, of uh, cells and the overall um, structural mass and also the location the location can slightly shift from person to person and this is actually a very significant idea idea because it actually it's a problem and what it means is that our brains differ greatly at extremely low levels of uh, sorry, this should say high levels of magnification at, at low levels of resolution. Um, so when we zoom into any person's brain and we zoom into another person's brain at the same level in the same area, we probably will not see, you know, rarely will we see the exact same things in both people's brains. This is when we're zoomed in close to, to the brains. But when we zoom out to a higher level, they start to resemble each other much more roughly. And when we zoom out to the highest level, you know, overall then they resemble they appear very similar and a lot of the anatomical texts that um, people may refer to especially that's used in, in, in um, you know medical education um, go into the higher levels and, and the lower levels they don't really talk about because all of these were written 20 30 40 you know or, or the images also are, are from older the, some some of them are the most recent ones tend to be about 10 years old so they, they all predated the, these new maps that we have that came out last year um, but these new maps really give us a much better understanding of the variation in brain um, from person to person. And what that really means is that when you talk about a map of the brain, um, the map of the brain now has a new word added to it, which is called probability. And those of you who know in science, probability is, is in a lot of places. But in neurosciences, probability was introduced now because what that means is that when we talk about a particular brain region, what we have to say is that there's a certain probability of it appearing existing in a certain location with a certain shape, with a certain size, depth, etc. There's a probability around the characteristics of each of these regions. And that makes it a lot more difficult, but, but that's the way you know, things are. So that's one aspect that's very important to understand. Um, another aspect is that the, the functional map, so this effective map that we have, is still incomplete. I mean, a lot of work, you know, over 10 years went into uh, these two efforts. Each, each team spent over 10 years mapping the, the human brain. Um, and even then, a lot of the information is, is incomplete because the map that what we have are not really functional maps. They're, they're structural maps, meaning they, they, um, they look at the brain and they uh, split it, you know, partialize it. They, they uh, split it apart into regions based on uh, various factors. And I'm going to go into that in, in a later slide, but they, but they look at only the the physical nature of those regions of the brain. And when they see differences in the physical nature of it, they, they call them different, uh, uh, they gave them different identifications. Although functionally, many of these regions also tend to have different uh, purposes. They tend to do 
uh, different functional uh, activity. But you know, in terms of a functional map, we don't have a very good functional map um, in the sense that what each region does, uh, you know, we, we have a very rough map still. Um, and there's two, two things, there's two problems here. One is that we don't know every function, or, or another way to say it is every behavior that a given region provides. We don't know that. We know that the high level ones that, you know, so for example, um, the, the parietal lobe, we, we, or sorry, the occipital lobe, we, we know that it provides mostly vision. Um, but when we get toward the edges of the occipital lobe and when it starts to merge with the parietal lobe, um, those areas of vision actually also start to behave in uh, spatial in a spatial sense. So our, our brain also, you know, gives us a sense of space around us, of what objects are around us, what people, everything that is around us. And there's a visual sense to that, and there's a non-visual sense to that. And so as you get into the edges of the um, the uh, the um, occipital lobe, as it as it starts to merge into the parietal, those regions of the brain, even though it may be part of the occipital lobe, um, it actually is doing multiple functions. Uh, not just vision, but it's also doing spatial functions. And it may actually be also doing, um, taking on very, very lightly um, somatosensory functions, you know, in the sense of when we're sensing things. So, for example, the audio. Audio is a spatial thing, right? We can hear the direction that a sound is coming from. So, uh, so the function that a particular region provides is not um, very uh, strongly uh, um, delineated. Um, and, and especially when we start talking about the secondary, tertiary, um, you know, more complicated functions in, in a region, uh, we, we lack that right now. And the second aspect that we lack is that um, for, uh, for a given function, uh, for example, vision, you know, we don't know all of the parts of the brain, all of the regions of the brain, where it maps to, where it resides in. Um, vision is one of those that, that we know more about because it's been studied extensively and it's, it's more easier to study. Um, but even vision, believe it or not, doesn't reside only in the visual cortex, in, in the, the occipital lobe. It actually also flows into the temporal lobe. So a lot of our, you know, the side areas of our brain is also involved in vision, although they, they do you know, more higher level parts of, of vision processing. Um, so the, these are all important ideas. Um, next slide, we're going to go into a little more stuff. So, so all these reasons are parcelated um, by the structure of the cells. That's something I mentioned earlier. And they often, but not necessarily always, they also are linked to the function that that region um, imparts, uh, you know, the behavior that comes out of that, that, that region. Um, so that's important to understand. Also, there are a lot of um, characteristics that, you know, for a given region, um, for, for the frontal lobe, let's say. Okay? And, and the regions that I'm giving, you know, the parietal lobe, the occipital, these are very, very large regions. They're actually smaller regions that most people won't be aware of, but so I'm using the ones that, that are probably more understood by people. So the, so the, um, uh, the frontal lobe is, is where the, um, you know, the front of, of the brain, in both hemispheres. And, and so, for example, for that region, um, um, in every person, there will be characteristics of that frontal lobe that are similar across the board. Um, but there are many, many characteristics. So, for example, the types of neurons across the frontal lobe. Now, the frontal lobe is a huge, huge region, and, and this actually applies to even smaller regions. So the frontal lobe actually breaks down into, uh, I don't remember exactly how many, but it, it's it probably 40 or more regions that it itself breaks down into. So any one of those regions would have a distinct set of, of you know, maybe two or three types of neurons throughout it, not very many. Um, also, that a particular region would also have um, a set of support cells, glial cells, okay, which are not are not neurons. They don't um, uh, take part in in what we traditionally think of the brain as doing, um, you know, of, of thinking and processing information. Also, vasculature, blood vessels. Those are parts of of each region and that are very important. The morphology or the structure of, of the cells and and the vasculature within that region is also very important, and that also is specific to that region. So when we go from person to person, it will be shared, but it's also unique to you know to that region. And then um, all of the neurons within that region will be wired together somehow. And I bolded that, that word somehow because that's a very key idea of the type of wiring that will exist in that, in that uh, region. And we'll go into that in later talk, in, sorry, in a later slide. But, but that idea I want everyone to, under, to understand and remember 
that the way that the neurons are wired is a very, very important part of, you know, of, of the brain. Um, so just on this, uh, on, on neurons, a, a single neuron typically has around 10, between 10,000 to a million neighbors. Okay. So remember, neurons are very, very small. Um, and, you know, in, in a millimeter, you can have, you know, a million cell, a million neurons. Actually, you, you, we have more than just neurons in, in, a, in, in any space in the brain. But if you only really look at, the, at uh, neurons, uh, there can be, you know, anywhere from 10,000 to a million neighbors just of one neuron. Um, and that's important to know that, that th th this is a very, very dense um, structure that, that the brain has. Second idea that's important is that that single neuron, even though it has 10,000 to a, bil to a million uh, neighbors, typically it connects to only a thousand of its neighbors. So it's connecting to a tiny fraction of the neighbors that it has. That's very important to know. And what that means is that the, um, and, and in, you know, I'm not going to go into network theory a lot, but, but there's a lot of network theory that applies to this. What that actually means is that the model that our brain uh, uses, you know, evolution has, has helped it form and, and develop in this way, is it's known as a small world model. It, it's a very sparse network, not very many, um, connections and, and you know I'll go a little bit into that it, it also actually has um, repercussions on how efficient our brain is our brain actually is very efficient in terms of energy and how fast it does things and this is one of the reasons why because it is a, a small world network because the neurons only have only connect to um, a small number of their neighbors um, and then also in, when we're talking about a region it's also important to recognize that a region has many neighbors around it and the neighbors that form that that are exist around a specific region um, are always the same from person to person. That's important to, to know. And then uh, the predominant function that is provided by a region, whether it's one function or a small number of functions, is always the same from person to person. So regions map, you know, from person to person across a species, and actually a lot of these also map across species. So many of the regions that we have also exist in many primates and they actually, actually exist in some of the lower mammals. Um, and that allows us to do a lot more um, sophisticated analysis and, and it helps us understand better, you know, the, the differences between brains and why some why particular regions um, work the way they, they work. Lastly, I just want to mention, I, I mentioned at the beginning, the term region is, is a very generic word. Um, there are many other words that are used, other words that I've used here. Parcellation is, is a word that you'll find it's more um, uh, um, advanced word, but basically it, that, that's the, in, in scientific literature, if you're going to read it, parcellation is typically the word that's used to, to denote this. And then module is, is another word that, that you'll find common, but these are the more technical terms. Um, next, uh, I want to just mention some things on behavior. So, you know, what, what the topic for tonight is really around how our behavior is driven by, or is it driven by just this, this network of cells? Okay. Um, and, and if so, how can that be? So I want to talk a little bit about behavior. So behavior arises, and this is, this is across every living thing that has a brain. Um, behavior arises from the interplay, which basically means that the talking, you know, the neurons communicate between each other, they talk with each other. So behavior arises when neurons talk between clusters of neurons. And in some cases, it's also not just neurons, it's also glial cells that, that interact because they also um, uh, uh, emit and, and absorb uh, neurotransmitters. All of the communication happens using neurotransmitters and ions. So this talking um, between cells and clusters of neurons and, and, and glial cells, this is really what causes behavior. Um, at, that's the simplest way to explain it. And then we're going to go a little more detail on um, what that means. And, and so behavior typically requires millions or even billions of neurons. And, and remember, um, our, the, the adult brain has roughly 86 billion neurons in it. Um, a child's brain, you know, at, at birth has roughly 100 billion, has many more neurons than the adult brain. And, and those many of those neurons get pruned out by the time they, they reach age uh, seven, eight. So, um, so still, in, in any case, we're talking about at least 86 billion neurons, which is a huge number across the entire brain. Um, when we're talking about the, the cortex itself, though, it's a smaller number. It's around 16 billion. Um, it's smaller and more manageable, but still it's a huge number. But, so what that means is that the, the signaling, the talking, right, or the activation between all of these neurons is very important. 
So what happens is that behavior requires, usually it's millions or tens of millions or even hundreds of millions of neurons. They have to act together. They have to, to um, activate together um, or turn on together, fire together. You know, um, um, although I put together in quotes because it's not that they're at the exact same instant they're firing. It's actually a cascade. It's a signal. It's sequential. So one neuron fires, it fires its neighbor, its neighbor, neighbor then will fire other neighbors. And it, it kind of flows around in this um, movement, you know, across millions of, of, of neurons. But all of those neurons, if you if you take a slice of time, let's say, let's say, um, uh, you know, a, a 500 millisecond, half a second time, a time period of half a second, then millions of neurons will fire within that half a second. But across that span of half a second, all of them will not fire together. Some of them will start and then that those will cause other neurons to fire and those will cause other neurons to fire. So over that half a second time period, it will be a sequential cascade of, of firing of neurons. So in a sense, they're activating together. You know, they're, they're all within half a second, but they're not all, all ident simultaneous. That's important to understand. Um, and so when when a specific cluster of neuron starts to act together, so they all fire, you know, somewhat sequentially, what that firing does is there are certain neurons, certain what what are called hub neurons, and we'll get into that later. These hub neurons are really, really important for that cluster. They're almost like the, um, you know, the like the, the MVP or the quarterback, and you know, on our team. Um, and and those neurons are actually the ones that link to completely distant brain regions, other brain regions, and they signal those other groups, those other regions. So when one region has a lot of processing going on, it also then eventually signals other groups, one or more other groups, other regions. And these hubs within that first region, first group, will be responsible for signaling, for sending a signal out to the other regions. And then those other regions will have their own processing that starts to happen, and they may send it to other regions and eventually they come back to the original region. So this, it's a dynamic interplay. But what's important is that the, the initial cluster that, um, form, that, that fires starts the behavior. But then that behavior requires other regions usually. I mean, unless it's a very simple behavior. Simple behavior might be localized only to one region, but most behaviors that we have are not that simple. Um, and they, they do activate other regions within our brain. So that's very important is that those other regions get signaled and activated. So what specific behavior um, arises? This is a question that, um, uh, you know, for, for example, when, when we have a, a specific behavior arising, let's say you're moving your arm, um, you're raising your arm, okay? Um, so exactly which uh, regions are activated and what is happening inside the brain when you're raising your arm will depend on several things, okay? It will depend on which other regions um, so I'm talking. So this is talking about that first region, that first cluster that acted together, and then they signaled to other groups. Okay, it will depend on which other groups they activate. Right, that's very important. So, so for example, um, when when we want to raise our our hand or our arm, one of the first things that will have to happen is that we have to have an idea in our mind that we want to do this before we even start to activate the muscles. We have to have the intention of raising our hand. Right, that intention will start probably in the executive function in, in the in the um, uh, uh, the frontal lobe, um, and that idea then actually in the frontal lobe there's the, the subregions. So it'll start in one of the sub in, in probably the prefrontal cortex, um, which is at the very front of, of our uh, frontal lobe, um, and from there there will be signals sent to other regions. And so depending on which regions those signals get sent to, that will determine what behavior this is all about. So in this case, we're talking about, we're working backwards in this case. We know the behavior is raising your hand. So we're working backwards. But the way it happens with the brain is that there's an initial impetus, there's an initial, you might say, idea that forms, you know, that I want to raise my hand. That idea starts in the prefrontal cortex. And the prefrontal cortex has to activate other parts of the brain. And that's what this is talking about here is, is what other regions that it, it signals are important. That really determines what, what will be happening during this behavior activity. 
Um, another point that's important here at the end is this multiple signals is that when, when a brain region signals other regions, it doesn't just send a signal, single, it's not just one hub uh, neuron that sends a signal to another hub neuron in the other region. There may be thousands or even millions of signals that are sent. And those signals all mean very different things. They don't all mean the same thing. So the signaling is, is also very complicated. It's not only that we have millions and billions of neurons, but we have millions and billions of activations of signals being sent. And the signals aren't all sent all at once. You know, it's, it, you know, and the, the order of these signals may actually be important. So it's, it's really complicated. You know, we're not going to go into detail in this, but I want people to understand in general that, that um, the information that flows from a region to region is important and that the information that flows is pretty complicated. It's not just a single message or a single um, wire that connects them. It's, it's, it's a, you know, pretty complicated. Uh, another thing that happens is that um, this, you know, an example that I gave, the prefrontal cortex will signal to another region, and then that region will probably signal to a third region, and then that region will signal to others. And so over time, we'll have many, many, many regions that have become activated, and that's known as a cascade. So the first one activates a second one. It actually may activate more than one. It may activate two as its neighbors. And then those two neighbors may activate, you know, five in total. So, you know, that's known as a cascade. So the type of cascading that happens and the rate at which, how quickly it happens, um, all of those things also affect the behavior, the specific behavior that, that we're going to, uh, to observe in that person or in that animal. And then it also depends on after um, one region activates the other region, um, the, that second region that gets activated, only some neurons in that, some clusters or some neurons in that will be activated, will be turned on, not all. So, depend, so which specific neurons and clusters get activated in that uh, target region, in the second region, is also highly depend, also depend, determines um, what and how that behavior will arise in that, in that person or animal. So all of these things are very important to control and, in a sense, affect the behavior that we have. Um, the bottom line in all of this is that um, the brain is a massive, massive uh, set of interconnected neurons, and we call this a network of cells. It's, it's really massive, you know, again, 86 to 100 billion um, in the average person. Um, and this wiring map of all of the neurons is one of the most important determinants of function behavior. Actually, it, it's an important determinant of many other things also, of, of um, neuroplasticity, of efficiency, of um, you know um, diseases. I mean, it, 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 the wiring map can affect many, many things in, in, in a brain. But the most important uh, determinant for how we behave and what, uh, what happens in our behaviors is the wiring map of all of these you know, billions of neurons in, in our cell. These are the two most important ideas that, that I want everyone to understand. And we're going to go further into, into this a little bit more. So um, I'm going to go just a little bit into, into this next part, and then we'll take a break. Um, but the brain is a network of cells. Th this is an important idea. Now, what I want to do is, is I want to, so let me just summarize three key ideas here. That it's the brain is a matrix with billions of neurons, and those neurons are clustered in uh, you know, subregions as well as in larger regions. Um, all neurons, every neuron is interconnected in a wiring map. Okay, that's very important to understand. And then uh, this wiring map, uh, or the how of how these neurons are connected, is very, very important, is the one of the most important things in terms of behavior and function. These three important ideas um, we're gonna we're gonna you know, use that as a, as a starting point. Now, uh, the next part I want to go into is, is we're tying this into evolution because in, in, in the write-up, th there's two ideas I want to present. One is that the brain is a network of cells. That's a very important idea. And the second is there's an idea called evo-devo. And I won't go too much into that because that's a very, very complicated. It actually doesn't involve only the brain. It involves our body. But what I want to do is I want to I specifically talk about how it relates to the brain and we'll do a little bit of that here so first the brain you know we all know that, that we are multicellular okay um, you know we have more than one cell and our cells are grouped first into tissues and then into organs and organ systems um, and the brain is one of those organ systems now the brain is different from everything else in biology 
Um, it's, it's one of the most unique, and, and this applies to every organism, not, not only the human or the primate brain or even mammal brains. Um, every brain is different from every other type of system in, in biology because of these three things. One is that its purpose, its, its only purpose is information. It, it processes information um, or it manages information. And that information comes from outside the brain, which means it can come from the body or it can come from the external world. Um, so its purpose is to process information from outside of itself. The second purpose of the brain is to change itself. Okay, this is very, very important. No other organ, I mean, other organs do this somewhat, but most organs do it in a very limited way. The brain, the entire reason for the brain is to change itself rapidly, frequently over time. And in a sense, what it does is it is trying to, so, what one, so one of the things what it does when it changes itself is it's learning. As the brain learns things, it learns by changing itself. Or meaning whenever we learn something, that learned information, that learned knowledge is recorded in the brain by the way the brain changes itself, by the, by the structure, the topology, and the wiring changes in the brain. That's how information is stored in the brain, one of the ways it's stored in the brain. So for example, if we live in a world where, if we're born in, in a world where gravity is very, very low, let's say that, we, that, that you know, in the future, you know, we have a colony on, on the moon and people are born there and they live there their entire life. Gravity on the moon is very different from gravity on the earth. Now, our brain is structured in a way that it doesn't know anything about the world. It doesn't know that we're born on earth. It doesn't care that we're born on earth and it's adaptive. It's, it's hyper adaptive. What, what, what that means is that it's able to function and, and figure out and function and work correctly in any world that, that it's planted onto. So if in the future we're living on Mars or the moon, and I chose the moon because the moon has you know, one sixth of gravity. It's a much, much different type of environment in terms of motion. So if a person were born on the moon, their brain would not feel, it would know nothing about earth gravity. It would only know about moon gravity and moon gravity would be normal to it. It would feel comfortable to, to that person. Um, and that person would learn, the brain would learn and absorb this one sixth level of gravity that this person is born into. And the way that that person's brain sees motion. So for example, on earth, when we drop something, it drops at a certain rate or when we throw a ball up, it goes up at a certain velocity and comes back down at a certain velocity. Well, on the moon, that won't happen. But the reason why we, we feel comfortable with, with the way that things move on Earth is because we're born into this environment, into this gravity. If someone were born on the moon, they would be born in a very different environment and their, and their brain would learn and be very comfortable with that totally different type of gravity. And their brain would encode their comfort and their knowledge of this one sixth level of gravity and the way that things move differently. Um, so that's very important is that the brain would, would form itself um, and then thereafter change itself based on the physical world that's, that is, exists. And there, there are many, many examples of this that on earth we've, we've found. I mean, there are experiments where you know, there, there are special classes that, that we've given to people for various reasons. They're, they're not, they're, they're for um, sometimes correcting a, a deficiency in their brain. But what, what these glasses do, it, it totally changes the way that they see. And what we notice is that the person is disoriented for a few days, sometimes a week. But after about three weeks, their brain completely learns to see the world in a completely different way because they're wearing this, these glasses, you know, all the time when, when their eyes are open. And their brain basically readapts itself to see the world in a different way. And one example of this is that we've, we've given people glasses which turn the world upside down literally upside down. Everything that you see is upside down. Now, if you wore glasses like that, for the first few minutes, you would not be able to move. You would fall down literally every time you tried to move because it is so disorienting. And people who are given these glasses, that's what happened. They were disoriented for days. But over around three weeks, they became completely used to it. And there was no difference in how their brain saw the world than when before they had these glasses put on. And then similarly, when they take the glasses off, they go through a very similar disorientation because by that time the brain has become comfortable with an upside down world and it has to become uncomfortable. It has to re comfort itself with the way that, you know, this right side up world is. So, so that's important to understand the second one. Third point is that this change that the brain um, exerts on itself is rapid. Um, and because it's rapid um, and constant, it is able to adapt to pretty much anything, you know, uh, High, and rapid is, is depending on the type of change we're talking about. 
So um, when we're hearing sounds or seeing things, we can adapt to them in milliseconds because if something is moving in front of us, our brain has to literally be able to track that motion. Our retina and our brain has to be able to change itself very, very quickly to be able to notice that this object is moving rapidly in front of us. So it can do that. But then when we're talking about um, other things, for example, the a pattern with the way the, the location on the horizon that the sun rises, you know, the changing of the seasons, that the um, and the time of time of day that the sun rises. These are things that change slowly, but over time our brain will notice patterns in that. Even though those are slow, slow moving parts of the world, but you know, in ancient times people noticed these, and that's why we came up with this concept of calendar because we notice these very slow moving things, and the brain still was able to adapt and, and recognize these changes. So these three things are, are fairly important to differentiate the brain from everything else in you know, in, in the biological world. Um, this last bullet is, is summarizes this, that, and, and it's gonna go into the next slide, that the brain uses the laws of evolution to change itself. And this is the part about Evo Duva I'm gonna go into a little bit, that um, evolution is a very important concept in our development. We, we Hopefully everyone understands that, but particularly for the brain, it's more important because the brain uses the laws of evolution. Not, not only did the laws of evolution form the brain, but day to day, minute by minute, the brain actually uses the laws of evolution to change itself. Okay, above, you know, in, in the previous bullets I talked about, the brain's purpose is to change itself. So one of the one of the principles, the physical and biochemical laws that it uses, is uh, the properties of evolution to do that. So again, the brain uses the laws of evolution to change itself. Um, the first thing the brain does, so when we're talking about a brain that, that in, a, in an infant, in a, in a fetus, when it's growing, um, it grows, the brain uses evolution, the laws of evolution, to form itself into a complex organ. It starts from a very simple neural tube, okay, which literally it's a, it's a tube um, that runs the, the length of the, of the fetus. Um, and then the, uh, the shape and the structure of, and this applies not only to, to our brain, but all organs, but the shape and structure of our brain and of all of our organs, they are um, affected by the forces present. So for example, gravity is a force, but there are many other forces. Temperature is, is, is a force that, that, that you know, if, if, if a baby is growing in a very cold, so for example, if the mother's, mother's body is very cold, um, we see this in the animal world more, where, where animals that are born in the Arctic region where the temperature is so low, um, their development formation of their brain, but their body also, is very different. Even though they still form, uh, follow the rules of evolution, they grow and develop quite differently because the environment outside exerts different forces on them. For example, temperature. When it's a very cold temperature, it causes them to grow in, in different ways more slowly. Their, their metabolism is much more slow. So it, it, you end up with a different type of animal. Um, Another thing is that the um, what the as the brain grows you know, in a fetus uh, before birth, um, it's using two principles of evolution um, to grow the the network of neurons that the brain eventually becomes. Um, one of these is, and it's it, both of these it's trying to minimize. So one is the metabolic cost. Or in terms of energy, the cost that the that the that the mother and the fetus needs the the amount of energy that the mother and the fetus need to use to physically build brain cells and regions of the brain and the body, um, that's a metabolic cost. So it tries to minimize that metabolic cost. And evolution is, is does the same thing. And the brain learned this from evolution. In a sense, it's been encoded in our in our DNA. That's what's driving our brain to do this. But but our brain follows that. The second is minimization of of material cost. And that's where you know the the matter, um, the minerals, um, oxygen, uh, water molecules, all of these things that the fetus needs and uses to build physical brain cells and other cells, um, is also an aspect of this that comes from uh, from evolution. And what that does, the second uh, part of this second bullet of this third bullet, is that this preferentially forms short range connections and this is important i'm not going to go too much into this but this is important to understand but uh, so what that and earlier when i talked about that a single neuron only 
forms neighbors, connections with a thousand of its neighbors, meaning it's, it's a small world network. It doesn't connect with most of the neighbors that it has. It connects with only a tiny fraction. That is part of this, what this is saying, is that um, it forms short-range connections because short-range connections are more efficient energy-wise. You know, it takes a lot more energy to, to send an axon, you know, uh, 0.4 millimeters away versus uh, 0 0.01 millimeters away. It takes a lot more energy and matter to do that. So it, it forms short-range connections. And what that means is that the topology of the brain is basically built on these short connections, these short hops from neuron to neuron to neuron. So for a signal to go from one, one side of the brain to the other side of the brain, it has to pass through you know, millions and millions of neurons. It, you know, Very few of our information goes from one neuron all the way across to the other side of the brain instantly to another neuron. It passes through many, 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 many segments. And that's important. That's what this, this is talking about. And that changes how the brain functions also. Um, so the first step, you know, talked about um, the brain developing first in pr prior to birth. And then after birth, after we're born, then day to day, how the brain operates in all of us today, right at this minute, how our brain is operating is also driven by evolution. Um, one of the, the principles that, that is, is affected, that is, affects it is known as allometric scaling. So this is, this is where the, um, uh, proportion of our body, actually, I don't know, I, I had a slide, I think that slide may be on a, on a different, um, uh, anyway, so, so the allometric scaling is very important. What, what, this, what this says is that the size, if you look at the size of the human brain relative to the body size, okay, when a baby is born, their brain and their head is much larger relative to their body than for an adult. And this is, this is what this is saying, that the scaling of an organ to the full body um, is controlled by evolution. So this is something that uh, is um, built into the brain. Um, next is the shape and structure of our organs. Um, actually, I think, uh, so anyway, let me... Um, I, I just noticed an error in, in my slide, but that's okay. I'll, I'll, uh, so what, what our, our brain is doing is um, actually, the, 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 I had edited the, the slide and, and this, this doesn't have the, the correct text, but basically um, day to day, what, what, our, what our brain is doing is it's, um, it's using the rules of evolution to, um, to change how we, how we, uh, how we behave. So for example, the, um, uh, the way that we use energy, so in the previous slide I talked about, uh, in this previous section I talked about metabolic cost and material cost. This applies also day to day because as the brain forms new connections, the wiring within neurons, the same thing applies. It only builds connections if it's efficient. And if the, um, uh, one way to think of it is, is in evolution, everyone understands that there is a, a fitness test that evolution imposes on any organism. So, for example, if if um, if uh, an an animal uh, has a mutation, it, if it if you know an infant is it grows with uh, a slightly different body structure than its parent, okay, it, it has a mutation. Then, if that child animal will be able to survive or not with that mutation, will depend on whether that mutation uh, passes the fitness test of its environment. So if that, let's say that animal is born with shorter limbs, okay? Now if that animal will survive in, in its environment or not, using those shorter limbs or not, depends on how those shorter limbs interact with its environment. So if it's, if it give, those shorter limbs give the animal a better way of, of moving, a faster way of, of, of moving, let's say, then that change is, a uh, uh, is beneficial and that animal will survive. Well, the same thing happens in our brain. There's a fitness test applied. So every time our brain forms a new connection in the wiring, it uses a fitness. It, it, it's not that the brain uses evolution and the way the brain works, that it's it's formed into our DNA. The, the fitness of that wiring is tested, similar to how this new animal being born gets tested in its environment. That new wiring gets tested within our brain and that wiring may not survive. It may be pruned out early on after a few you know, hours or days. 
And then that, that, you know, because the neuron wants to, you know, and so that may be one of the reasons why it's difficult to learn some things, because even though we're learning them in the beginning, you know, sh short term memory has them and, and then they eventually go into longer term memory, but then they disappear. You know, we forget them after a few days. You know, for example, when you cram for a step for exam, you remember them for about a week and then you forget them. This is a reason because, you know, the, the fitness test is that you need to keep using that information that you learned. And if you stop using that information after the exam, most people say, well, I don't need to remember that anymore. They stop remembering it. And then the brain sees that 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 new those new connections are no longer being used. And so it starts to lose the fitness test. It doesn't continue and the brain prunes them out. So there are many, many aspects of day to day operation that happen in, in the brain that, that are similar to um, uh, to uh, uh, in, in the natural world with evolution. So um, the next idea, and then we're going to stop after, after this, is that evolution builds complex things. Uh, given, I think everyone understands that um, evolution uses long time spans to manage or to tame the complexity of, of the things that it builds. For example, um, with life on Earth, life started at around half a billion years after the Earth started. Okay, so it was a relatively short time after Earth started. So after the Earth formed, within half a billion years, unicellular life started to appear on, on our planet. Okay, but from those unicellular life, they were basically bacteria and protozoa and, and different, very, very simple organisms. From that time period to the point at which we started to get the earliest mammals took an additional 3.8 billion years. Okay, that's a huge amount of time. So to get from a single cell to a mammal which has billions of cells, right, took us 3. Point, took evolution 3.8 billion years. So it, it, it used time. Time is a tool that evolution has to build in complexity because over time it was able to test out these fitness rules, you know, that we know about in, in evolution, that the, this change in, in the cell, that single cell, did something which allowed it to split into two, right? And then if it survived that fitness test, then, you know, those two cells would exist separately. But at some point in the past, those two cells stayed together. They clumped together even after they had split. And then if those uh, sticky pair of cells survived long enough and they split again, then evolution basically found a way to keep these cells that are splitting together and form a multicellular organism. And so 3.8 billion years is a long time, but that, that's what was, was a tool that evolution had. Um, so that's, and that's an important tool. So prior to this, I talked about two other tools. So um, I'm going to try to tie these together here. So evolution managed complexity in our brain and body using a few, a few uh, systems. So again, the allometric proportioning is so I'm tying these together from, from from the previous slide. So this is this graph basically shows um, two lines. So the blue line is the way that our body grows and it grows almost linearly in, in time from time. So the bottom you'll see age um, roughly zero to and to the right is is uh, uh, 11 years. Um, and as a person grow and it's it's actually a log scale. So um, it's it's not years, it's uh, body size, it's in grams, so the mass of the body. So the right side is an adult, the left side is an is a infant. Uh, and as our body grows from infancy to adulthood, it forms a certain path which is linear. Now the red line, the red uh, dots represent the brain. Actually the, the blue represents our heart and the red represents our brain. And the, the line, um, the solid line represents our body. Okay. And so the heart basically follows, is proportional to our body size. That's important to understand that our, as our heart grows, as our body grows, our heart keeps up and grows proportionately. So it almost always is able to supply and, and, and function with our body in step. But the brain doesn't follow that, that method. When, when an infant is born, its brain is huge already. It's, it's not, you know, if, if the brain followed the same thing as the heart, the brain size would be down here. Near, near the bottom of, of the graph. We would have a much, much smaller brain in an infant. But in our world, babies have much larger brains because it doesn't follow a, um, you know, the, al the allometric style of the brain is very different than the allometric style of the heart in the sense that the brain starts from a very large size 
and it grows somewhat until about um, age uh, seven, eight, ten, and then it almost st uh, becomes static. It actually prunes, and then it re remains almost static for the rest of our lives. Um, and, and that's a very different trajectory um, than, than any other organ that we have. So that's one idea is this allometric principle. The other is the, that the shape and structure of our organs using, so again, I'm, this looks like it's a repetition, but it actually, it's, it's a restatement of the ideas prior that evolution allows our, uh, sorry, evolution um, uses these three principles. In the prior slide, I was talking about how the brain uses the, I, I talked about two principles, how the brain uses the, two, these two principles. Here I'm talking about evolution um, formed our brain and has taught our brain using these principles. Um, and there's a third principle I'll go into. Um, so, and, and the third principle is this minimization, which you know we talked about earlier. All three of these things are essential to how our brain functions. And um, uh, it's, it's programmed into our genes and therefore how our brain forms and therefore how our brain operates day to day. Um, so evolutionary action is required to make the brain grow and function. And evolution makes a brain grow and function by changing itself every minute. Um, it only changes slightly, but, but still it's changing you know, every minute. So, so the brain is changing all of the time and evolution, the rules of evolution are what make it function and, and grow and change um, over time. So let me, um, actually I, I, can, I can go through this very quickly. So, so this last slide um, just finishes on the last idea. So the brain is a complex biological tissue. The brain is possibly the most complicated biological organ we have because its purpose is to modify itself um, and the brain manages its abilities, uh, its survival and its energy using me metabolic, and here I'm summarizing those three ideas that we just had, using metabolic, using material, and using time. These are three things that the brain uses to manage itself and everything that it does. Um, this is central to, to uh, the brain. And then in the primate, so for example, what that means is the primate brain has tamed the ability to survive, okay? It has become a, you might say, the apex survivor across the animal kingdom in a very competitive world and sometimes dangerous world because the primate brain has been able to manage all of these three things so well um, using time, using material, and using uh, energy. It's a, a metabolism. Um, so I'm going to stop here. Um, let me... Uh, all right. So we, go, go ahead. ahead. No, I, I, so we we can have a discussion on some of the some of the. Let ideas me let here. me let me. Uh, I okay. I have I have a lot. Uh, this is a firstly fantastic presentation, um, Sanjay. Thanks. This is one of my favorite presentations because it has taken really core ideas, you know, those two ideas of brain as a network and the Evo Devo idea. Uh, those are re really foundational ideas. Those are very simple ideas at the core, but they shape everything about the brain. And you did a good, you know, excellent job of kind of presenting what these are. And what I want to make sure is that people get these ideas. Okay, I want to have a discussion in a way where people can engage with it. And um, so I'm going to play around. This is, uh, so even if we get, just this across and most people, at least I, I would not say 100% of people, but if let's say 50% of the people can understand the depth of this and are inspired to look further, I think this would have been a fantastic, fantastic uh, meetup. So what I want to do is I want to just play around with the discussion to engage people as much as possible. So we will go in stages. That's what I was thinking of. First, I will have people put all their questions on the table. So we will see the shape of questions that people have. Let's see what questions people have. Okay, um, then maybe we'll answer some of them. Then maybe we'll take comments. Let's play it by the ear. I wanna see if, you know, how we can engage people to communicate this. So folks, it's time for questions. Okay, only questions at this point. Um, bigger the question, the better, okay? Um, Let's put all the questions on the table together. Let's see all the questions that people have, okay? 
And then we will go, we'll, depending on what we have, let's see what we can do with it. Okay, give me just a second here. Uh, go ahead and type an exclamation mark in chat or raise your hand in Zoom in order to ask questions. So it's going to be Laura, Prakash, Vanessa, and Madeline. Laura, what's your question? Okay, based on the last things you were mentioning about the brain's ability to grow con continuously, and wouldn't if I'm asking if at any point some part of the brain gets damaged, isn't it, wouldn't it be possible then for the brain to kind of cure itself if it was changing and growing constantly, or is Excellent. there some other issue involved? Excellent. Um, how does brain handle damage? Uh, next up is going to be Prakash, followed by Vanessa. Prakash. Yes, I have a question on the neuron connections. So when does the, the, the most of the connections are made? Is it in a childhood or does it stop making those connections sometime in life or is it a continuous process? Excellent. Uh, excellent. So how do, what is the chronology of development of connections? Uh, connections chronology. Excellent. Next up is going to be Vanessa followed by Madeline. Vanessa, what's your question? Okay, well, I had a related one about can the um, neurons or the network themselves like either signal or do the repairs, similar to like if a tractor trailer, you flash the headlights, it realize, okay, I, it's now safe enough for me to merge back in, like whether sending the signals or actually doing the repair themselves, neurons and the network. Okay, does the, does the, um, where does the, how, how does the repair take place? Um, next up is going to be Madeline followed by Jyoti. Yes, uh, thank you, Sanjay, this is terrific. Uh, my question is about the irregularity of the parcelization of brain regions. You mentioned shape, size, depth, mass, and location, and now there's probability. And I'm wondering if that is, um, it sounds like this new important thing, like maybe it's used um, to um, as a way to allocate percentages in people who are different. So you can look at the range rather than saying this is what's normal and these people are abnormal in these different ways. Uh, so you're asking um, the, uh, can, you, uh, can you just phrase the question? Uh, I'm asking, okay, um, what, what is, um, what is the variable of probability in the parcelization of brain regions? Okay, very good. Probability in parcelization. Very good. Uh, next up is going to be Jyoti followed by Mike A. Jyoti. Firstly, thank you, Sanjay. As usual, you've done a fantastic job. Uh, my question is, this seems like a very fine network of uh, glial cells, neurons, and what have you. What if they get tangled? What are there, there's a problem with the behaviors or uh, what, how will it impact a human being? Thank you. Is there anything, anything such as tangled in the, in the network? And if so, what are its implications? Next up is Mike A followed by Allison. Mike. Yes, yeah, Sanjay, you mentioned the, um, the pruning process. And I also heard it in uh, one of the introductory videos. I'm just wondering, does our constant exposure to electronic media, is our brain kind of parsing out things that, for example, writing with a pen or paper, as I would have done 20 years ago, as opposed to us constantly being exposed to this type of media? So is there a parsing, I mean, a pruning process going on because of technology? Wonderful. Um, so um, I'll put it in two parts. So one is what's the nature of the pruning process and is it affected by modern technology? Uh, next up is going to be uh, Allison. If anybody else has questions, go ahead and type exclamation mark. So it's going to be Allison followed by Judy. Allison. Hey, Sanjay, um, how does the brain develop when there's a learning disability or autism? Wonderful. Uh, how does the autism and learning disability, how is the brain development different? Excellent. Next up is going to be Judy, uh, Camillo, and Jyoti. Yeah, Judy. Somebody already somebody already answered my, my question. I just wanted to know how many cells does the brain have? Okay. 
Because I missed the number. And how did they how did they do the counting? I mean, what was the master cell? Was that, that that first cell? What was it? Was it like a master cell 30, 30, 3.8 billion years ago? I mean, is there like like a like a pyramid of importance of cells as they grew? Okay, wonderful. So um, so I'm going to put that as a question. Yeah. Um, the uh, give, give me just a second. Okay, so, so the uh, evolution of neurons. So let me just look at yeah. neurons. Neurons. Evolution of neurons. Cell, that's cell, that's cellular things are, cells are different issue. We are focusing on neurons. So yeah. Look at that. Uh, uh, next up is going to be. Um, thank you. Uh, Camilo, Jyoti, and Prakash. Camilo, uh, fake, well, folks, feel free to ask another question. That's fine. I want to get all the questions down so we know the shape of questions that are there on the minds of people. Okay, and questions are more important than answers. So let's let's get more questions. Uh, it's going to be Camilo, uh, followed by Jyoti. Camilo. Uh, hi, Dr. Sanjay. Thank you for your presentation on brain region, neuroscience, and uh, functional behavior of the regions. I'm a system control engineer in automation and uh, electronic robotics. Uh, my question is, is how come today we cannot model the brain mathematically as a differential equation uh, and a control system of stimuli and reaction of the human brain that learns and grows like a human with stochastic memory of the past and evolution as time increases, thus artificial intelligence, and we have to rely on um, fuzzy logic or smaller set systems like fuzzy logic with much smaller, um, I guess, capacity uh, than the whole set of all the billions of neurons. Thank you. That Thank you, Camilo. Um, so I'll put it as, uh, what are your thoughts about uh, computer modeling of brains? Uh, next up is going to be Jyoti uh, and Prakash. Jyoti. Yeah, since these behaviors are arising in different regions of the brain, and there are several behaviors because of the subdivision and what have you, what is the role of neurotransmitters in there? Very good. What's the role of neurotransmitters? And I'll make it more general in terms of because what um, Sanjay was saying was that it is small world. So what is the role of kind of long distance uh, communication within the brain? So I'll put the both, both of those as questions. Uh, next up is going to be Prakash. Prakash. Um, so doc, Dr. Sanjay, there is a question that, um, is it possible for a human to born without a, without a brain? Uh, he has a head, but maybe very tiny brain or totally absence of brain. So I'm trying to understand the central processing unit versus uh, local processes. Like I, okay. I think our body may have some local processes. So how does that work? Uh, thank you. Um, thank you. Um, all right. So let me try to put these questions. Um, so Sanjay, this is a wide variety of questions. Um, I'm going to add some questions on the Evo Devo. So just uh, let, let me see it. I thought your presentation, the Evo Devo part was particularly interesting. So folks, let me invite you to ask questions. If you have more questions about the Evo Devo part, the connection between most of these questions are focused on the network part, a large number of them. Uh, do, do you specifically have, if anybody has any questions, more questions on evolution, go ahead and put, put that. Um, Mike C, you have a question. Mike, go ahead. Mike, follow, Mike C, followed by OC. Okay. Um, I was curious about the types of connections. So, um, you know, computers, as an example, are zero and ones. Humans would be communication, you know, verbal communication, let's say, and whatever else fill in the blank. So what types of communication, as, as I understand, it was more of a vast type of communication. So it was just interesting okay. that. Wonderful. Uh, what's what type of communications are taking place? Uh, very good. Next up is O.C., Maritza, Madeline, and Vanessa. O.C. Yeah, my question in terms of evolution is, um, is there a general trend of evolution seeking to split the cell versus merging the cells? Okay, uh, very good. Uh, so split versus, uh, split versus merging the cells. So what in principle happens to cells? Do they split, merge, or something else in evolution? Uh, next up is going to be Maritza followed by Marilyn. Maritza. 
Um, so I, I had a question about um, specifically about this, the concept of evil devil. Are we looking at this from a matter of, is what you're saying that really small differences in like uh, phenotype and in um, like um, patterning, is that what we're seeing here? This is directly, this can be directly correlated to evil devil? Um, can you repeat it? I'm, I'm going to make sure I got like, it. Um, I guess the question is, um, what exactly is being affected by the concept of evil evil in um, geno in uh, genomes? Um, is it like just the patterning that's affected, or is it also the phenotypes that are uh, affected? Wonderful. What is affected by evil evil? Uh, Patterns. Okay, I'm going to add one question is, why is it that the brain of an infant is as large as it is as compared to proportionally as compared to a human being? Uh, so why infant brain? Okay, next up is Madeline, Vanessa and Jyoti. Madeline. Yes, uh, I was in a a meetup group on a different topic and someone who, who may have been Sanjay, in fact, uh, we were talking about competition. And this person said that uh, one of the reasons that we think in terms of competition is because our the neural networks in within a human brain compete with each other. Okay, and I was wondering if he could talk about that aspect of it, brain evolution in Excellent. just within within the functioning adult brain. Excellent. So uh, what is the role of competition within uh, brain networks? Excellent question. Fantastic question. Thank you. Uh, next up is uh, Vanessa, Jyoti, and Kevin. Vanessa. Has the network or just even the brain in general developed some sort of uh, protection to itself, just like a smoke alarm? Or if you, if you have an over uh, the electric it too much, it, it trips the circuit breaker. Is there something like that if it gets to hyperactive where it's either proactive and preventive, just to, nothing else to prevent damage? Wonderful, thank you. Excellent question. Uh, are there protective mechanisms uh, within, within this network? Uh, next up is Jyoti, followed by Kevin and Prakash. Jyoti. Yeah, how much does the environment play a role in the evolutionary process of the human being? Wonderful. What role does environment play? Okay, uh, next up, uh, we're going to take two more questions and then, uh, no, three more questions. You can actually keep coming as, as long as, uh, you know, when there are no, no more questions, then that, that's it. So uh, Kevin, Prakash, David, and Mike S. Well, Kevin. When, when Shrikanti, if I could just, yes. there's some others, there, there are some additional slides I do want to go into later uh, let, let's take yeah. let's take the questions because even yeah. if we just manage to because i want to see where people are uh you've been doing this entire series what i want to do today is i want to see exactly where people are and i want to engage them fully because i think that is going to play dividends for us throughout the entire year right then i i completely agree but but i what, what i'm saying is after the questions there, you know, maybe two or three slides I want to go into because sure. that's going to help people tie it because a lot of the questions that sure. I have, there's some new ideas that I didn't present yet, which will explain a lot of the questions. Okay, perfect. So what we will do is I will let's take all the questions. Yeah. Then we will do the three slides. Then we'll see if there are more questions and then we'll deal with all the questions. Yeah. Makes sense? Yep. Thank you. Uh, next up is going to be uh, Kevin. Yes, yeah, thank you. My question about the networked cells. Uh, is this, how is this different to computer network, like a wireless one and wired one? Any protocol specific for uh, networked cells? Thank you. Got it. Uh, how is the neural network dependent, uh, different from a computer network? Uh, next up is uh, Prakash followed by David and Mike. Prakash. Uh, I have a question about memory. So you said there are about 200 to 250 parcellations or the areas uh, that we map in the body, uh, in, the, in the brain. So 
is memory where the memory lies is like one of the area or memory lies everywhere or Got does it. the memory lies somewhere else in the body and the brain function brain knows how to access the memory but thank but the you location uh, where, where it lies is memory is uh, thank you uh, where is memory in the network uh, next up is uh, david followed by mike david all right so, yeah so uh, the evo you know the evolution of the environment uh, and then uh, we have to, and all living things have to track the evolution of the environment. And so, you know, and as the environment continues to change, our bodies and our brains track those changes. So we evolve just, uh, you know, in step with our environment. So my, my question is, uh, you know, at one slide said something to the effect that uh, the brain has biological differences, but actually the brain is made up of cells that acts, uh, you know, in a biological manner. And I don't understand what would, I mean, I, I you know, the brain is a- So go ahead, you know, under, so your, your question is, how is brains um, in interaction with evolution different from other, other uh, parts of our body? Is that your question? No, well, I don't think it is, but if you think it is, no, then- No, no, but go ahead, and, go ahead and uh, state your question then. Well, my, my, my question is really, uh, do you think there's anything unique about the brain that's non-biological? I guess is my question. Got it. I think Got it. That's, okay. that's my question. Is there anything else operating other than the forces of evolution and, and uh, biology? Thank you. Actually, um, physics. It's all physics. Thank you. Uh, thank you, David. Um, so I'm going to put it as, um, is... Is there anything operating in the brain which is more than evolution or is different in some way? Um, okay, um, next up is Mike S. Mike S, question please. Mike, Mike, your Mike is not working. Okay, we'll have to come back to you. Um, all right, Sanjay, so please go ahead and uh, do the yes. slides, and then we'll take more. Oh, wait a minute, Mike, Mike. Now? Yes, go ahead. Go ahead, Mike. Okay. When the brain forms new memories or learns a new task, uh, it encode, uh, there's kind of a micro evo, evo devo going on where it optimizes and tunes those connections. Uh, what... Uh, what part of the system decides that one tuning is better than another? Where does this optimization occur? Beautiful. And uh, is it just random and picks one, or is there some driving force in some primitive part of the brain that decides one is better than the other? Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Excellent, excellent question. Um, how does, uh, you know, how exactly does the optimization take place? Uh, what what are the principles? What are the mechanisms for opt optimization? All right, uh, folks, just amazing, amazing questions. So now we'll go to the remaining slides uh, by Sanjay, and then we'll come back and we'll do more questions, and then we will try to answer all the questions. All right, Sanjay. Well, um, actually, let me just clarify. I, I didn't want to do those slides right now. I wanted to go through many of the questions, and we can do the slides toward the end. Okay. Sure. Not, you know, I, I didn't want because those slides will tie together a lot of the okay. ideas. Sure. Sure. If I so you want them to... now, they won't make sense. A lot of sure. Probably be... So you would you'd prefer to uh, do them as a as a cap after afterwards after the um, questions, right? Well, they might they might raise more questions, but yeah. Sure. The sure. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. Sounds good. All right. So let me go ahead. Um, okay. So, so let's so let... let's say two thirds of the questions we can do now, and then. If, if it looks like, um, yeah, I mean. Do yeah, leave things. the time, leave the time to me. Let, okay. let, let's um, go ahead. And what, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to pose these questions to you, Sanjay, and try to answer them maybe in like two to four minutes, not more than that. Okay, and then we'll go because I want to have like a quick rundown of it. And folks, this, because we're doing the answers in brief, it may not fully answer what you what you were asking. Okay, if that is so, then please go ahead and raise the questions again after the slides, okay? So we're going to have one round of answers and then you will have one more chance to go ahead and raise, raise the questions, okay? 
Um, and uh, so let, let's go. Uh, let's go with this. So first, I want to take the idea of. Uh, so so there are two two things, right? There is a three themes of evolution, and themes of network. I'm going to look for questions on uh, evolution theme first. Okay. So um, let me ask the question that uh, Judy asks. You know, let's look at the evolution of neurons itself, the, the, uh, the, the new, you know, all, all the brains. How did they start? You know, what is the earliest, simplest brain and how did they grow over time? Uh, I mean, that's not something I, I can really answer that, that well. I mean, that's, that's more into evolutionary biology. And um, I mean, the, the, way, the way I can answer that is if we look within animals that exist today, organisms that exist today, um, the most simple organisms have the most simple brains because they, in, within the evolutionary tree, right, um, they have a, a earlier position. They, they developed first, they developed earlier, and they happen to stay around. You know, they, they've, been, they've been living for hundreds of millions of years because, because they were successful. Um, that doesn't mean that they were necessarily the representational to the first forms of life that developed neurons. Um, it's more likely that the first life forms that developed neurons have gone extinct. And the ones that we see today, the earliest, uh, simplest organisms we see today are simply the surviving uh, ancestors. But they give us a representative model to look at. Um, we, you know, and, and neurons are, are soft tissue, so they typically don't survive. Um, in the fossil record, There's, it's very, very difficult to to know. Um, sure, that, that, but if, if you look at look at uh, animals today, what what are, what would be some of the simplest brains that you can study? So, I mean, um, insects and um, there there are uh, very small organisms in the ocean. Mm -hmm. um, I I this is not something I I've, I've looked at. I I have don't have a lot of experience with outside primates and humans, but. Um, I know that in, in, especially if you look at the deep ocean and if you look at uh, areas away from uh, civilization, from land masses, there are many organisms that are quite simple, um, that have very, very simple uh, neural structures. And they, they would not be, we, we won't even call them brains because they're, they're actually there's uh, one organism that's studied extensively in, um, in the animal world is it's known as a nematode, it's, it's a type of worm. Um, C. elegans is, is the um, uh, people may be familiar with, and it's been it's been studied extensively to the extent that we know the exact number of neurons that it has. There are actually two forms of this of this organism. There's a hermaphrodite version, and then there's a male version. And the male version has exactly 300, and, I think 302. Or no, um, I, have a, I, I may have these backwards, but one version has 302 neurons exactly, and the other version has 385 neurons exactly. Um, and uh, actually, the male version is 385, um, and the ramp is 302 uh, neurons. And we we have a fairly extensive mapping of both of these networks, um, and we're starting to do research on their brain. And it's it's not really a brain. You can't think of a brain because these neurons are distributed throughout its body. It's a worm. So worms typically don't have uh, well, more advanced worms do, but but this is one of the earlier worms. So it doesn't have a cluster that we might call a brain, although it does have a cluster, but, but it doesn't seem to act as, as brains in, in other animals. Um, that's the simplest one that I know that we've studied extensively. Okay, um, so now let's take that, actually not a lot of questions on evolution, so, but a lot of questions on the network. So let's uh, start with the questions on the network. The first question was, how do these connections develop over time? How do the connections in brain develop over time? Okay, so this this is this is fascinating, and, and a lot of these things we've learned only in the last ten years, um, and and what that means is that we're going to learn much more in the next ten years. So any answer that I give aren't necessarily correct. They're they're the best that we know. It's it's not, it's not correct in the scientific sense that we don't know the full answer yet. I'm only saying, and and also, I won't assume that I know the full answer to what. Um, the research community has found. There are many things that I'm not familiar with, but of the readings that I've done, um, I'm going to provide based on that. Um, but I've tried to stay on, on, on top of this because this is, this is very important for, for me personally. Um, one of the things that happens when, when 
any brain, but in particular, you know, primate brain starts to develop is that the first few cells, you know, physically it's a very small region of, of, of uh, a space that the brain develops in. Um, it's very localized. So the physical distance between neurons is, is less. Um, and what that does, what that means is that the, um, the uh, development of the brain at that time is driven more by, excuse me, by randomness, by probability, than by genetic direction. Um, this is something that I think Maritza was trying to get into. But it's, it's not that our genes are driving uh, um, the full level of sophistication that the brain eventually has at that early stage. At that early stage, there's a lot more randomness going on. Um, and, and I'm talking much after the neural tube is developed. Um, so the, I'm trying to think of how to ex ex explain this using words and without a picture. So if you have, let's say, 10 different, 10 cells, 10, 10 neurons very early on, this is very, very, very early on. Those 10 cells are, you know, close to each other, relatively speaking. Um, but they're not really going to connect to each other in the beginning because, you know, and, and also you have to remember that the brain at that point is not really, it doesn't have a purpose. Okay, it's simply growing because every other organ and organ system in the body is growing. It's basically growing to build up mass. And after a certain point, will the axon start to, to develop in the brain? So after a certain point, um, the number of cells will grow to, let's say, several thousand or even a million. And then we may we'll start to see, and I don't know the exact number, but, but after a certain point, we'll start to see the axon start to develop to start to form this connection, this, this network. And at that early stage of where you only have, let's say, 10,000 neurons, um, at that stage, the you know, very small number of those neurons will actually start to form connections. But those, and, and let's just take uh, hypothetical numbers to keep it simple and, and to allow the, the, the explanation. So out of those 10,000 neurons, let's say that 100 of those neurons start to form connections with their neighbors, okay? Those 100 neurons will not all form the same type of connection. Some of those, the majority of them, will form very short distance connections with their immediate neighbors. Let's say 80 of them will form very short distance connections. And then another tw uh, 15 of them will form medium distance connections, meaning that they'll form connections with, with neighbors that are a little further downstream. And then the remaining five or so will form connections that are much, much longer, okay, out of those 10,000 neighbors. Um, and then as, the, as that mass of, of cells grow further, what happens is those connections, those axons that have already formed, grow with them. And what, what that means is that as that brain, if you can imagine that brain, when it becomes a child's brain at time of birth, when it's become, you know, almost uh, 15, 20 centimeters in, in, in uh, you know, uh, one dimension in length, um, those initial Uh, Sanjay, we have lost your voice. I think Sanjay is having some internet problems. Uh, let's see here. Uh, folks, can you hear me? Give me just a second. Yes. Okay. Yes, we hear you. All right. So it's uh, Sanjay's uh, problem. Okay. Uh, give me just a second. All right, uh, Sanjay should be back as soon as, uh, Sanjay, we can't hear you, so, okay, he has dropped off. He should be back in a minute, must be having some computer problems. Um, all right, so I'm gonna ask you the question. Uh, now I don't have Sanjay to answer the question, so I'm gonna ask you my question. If you have answers to that, go ahead and tell me until before Sanjay comes back. So there is a timer running. Why is it that an infant's brain is as large, is so much larger in proportion to their body than an adult? So why do we start with such a large brain? If you have answers, go ahead and type exclamation mark. 
OC, very quick answer. Sanjay is coming in back. Go ahead. Um, increased stimuli versus, you know, as an adult, the stimulus that you receive from reality is not as, um, not as extreme versus having being a child. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Sanjay, are you back? I think so. <laughs> okay. You, you are back. Okay. Very, very good. I mentioned I upgraded my Zoom uh, just a day ago, so I don't know if that's it. it just crashed. So anyway, okay, that's fine. You're you're back. Go ahead. So uh, um, I think where I left off was um, I was explaining when this initial set of of, of cells, ten thousand cells, grows into a, a child's brain. Mm -hmm. um, so th those initial connections, those initial hundred uh, axons that will form will actually become the major connections between brain regions. So those initial 100 cells will more than likely become the dominant cells in multiple of these brain regions around, around that child's brain. Um, and other cells, as that brain grows, the other cells that the other neighbors of, and so those cells will become the hubs. And this is what, one of the reasons why I tried, I said that there's additional slides that I have. Those slides will explain that I, I'm using terms like hub and module and things like that, that, that I'll get to. But if you can understand, you know, there are key, there, there are critical neurons in each region, and it's more than one critical. There, there's, you know, thousands and thousands of critical neurons. But these initial hundred neurons at, at the very early stage of development will become hubs, and because they form these axons, those initial axons will become the major communication pathways between regions of this brain. So, for example, the corpus callosum is is this vast network between the two hemispheres. So out of those 100 cells, maybe 10 of those cells, 10 of those axon external connections will become the foundation, the substrate for the corpus callosum. So I don't, hopefully this, this yep. explains you know, what, what, how it develops and, and grows. Wonderful. Do you want to talk more about, uh, talk to more about, uh, to Maritza's question about EvoDevo, the effects of EvoDevo? Evo um, so let me, uh, I had taken some notes, so let me see if I can get. Uh, I'm trying to find where exactly. Okay, so um, she was asking what exactly is being affected by the concept of genomes in Evo Devo? Is it just the patterning or also the phenotypes? I think that's that's what she mm -hmm. asked. That's what I wrote. Um, so. And again, I'm not an expert in Evo Devo, but and, and, and this is I, I want to focus this just on, on brain because that's the, the, the main thing here. Evo Devo has to do with everything else with, with our body and our in our uh, formation. Um, so um, Evo Devo it, it does affect the transcription, translation of our genomes, of our genes. Um, it directly affects that. But it it also so I'm trying to think of how to um, say this where I won't I, I won't um, it, it won't require other knowledge. So um, let me think let me try to explain it in, in the sense of nature and nurture. I think everyone's familiar with with these two ways of looking at uh, how we develop and, and what what affects our, our growth and development. Um, nature and nurture. So, so nature is uh, our genetics, and nurture is the environment around us. Um, what we've learned recently, and Evo Devo uh, corroborates this also. The idea of Evo, Evo Devo corroborates this also, is that our development is not simply nature, not simply nurture, and it's not simply the two. It's actually both of them always, but it shifts between them in different situations. It's like uh, nature and nurture is a continuum. You can think of it as, the, as a number line, you might say, um, where they fall on different edges, ends of that number line. And at any given instant and in any given uh, situation of let's say a single cell or even a, um, a, a sub uh, element of that cell forming or, or changing, um, the position on that line between nature and nurture um, shifts often and it's uh, it sh it shifts, but but and you can have actually more than one. Uh, so you can have uh, both 
effects from nature and effects from nurture simultaneously. It's actually much more complicated than most people think of it. Um, so, and, and, and again. Um, let's take a bunch of questions. Of the first one is about the idea of competition within these networks. Can you talk a little bit about that? Okay. Um, so um, the fundamental thing to understand about competition in the brain in, in general, I mean, there's two types of competition. One is at the lowest level, and I think the question has to do with that. And there was somebody who asked the question at the higher level. So at the lowest level, competition really follows the, the rules of evolution. It's much, much simpler than that. And the brain doesn't, the brain itself doesn't have to do any processing for that competition. The brain simply functions using the rules of evolution. So for example, the example I gave earlier where you have a neuron that, um, you know, as we learn, let's say we learn something, um, you know, we, we, we crammed for an exam that we have coming up and we studied for, you know, hours and hours and, and days. We've learned all of this new knowledge and that learning that we had, um, the way it's encoded in our brain is through formation of new um, segments of this network, new wiring within this network. That's what the learning is. Now, that learning um, has to survive for it to stick around, for it to stay in the brain. Um, because there's competition in the brain at a low level. Um, so each of those neurons that form new connections, those neurons also are used by our brain, by those regions of the brain, for other purposes. A neuron is rarely used for only one thing. Neuron is multitask, it's multimodal. And so, and so there are many forces acting on it in the sense that the activations, and, and the way to understand this is that a neuron has a dendritic tree, meaning it's getting signals from other neurons. And then it's it's all of the signals that it gets from other neurons. Um, it's the 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 um, soma, the the body of the neuron. Uh, each at each time, each moment in time, will decide whether it needs to fire or not, whether it needs to send pass off um, a, a new signal to its neighbors downstream or not. So out of and and, and again, it it probably will be connected to let's say. 500 neurons that are sending input into this neuron, it may be connected to, uh, well, let's say it's connected to 900 neurons in, on the internal side, 100 neurons on the external side. So out of those 900 neurons that it's connected to, that it's receiving signals from, that it's capable of, of receiving signals from, rarely will it be that all of those 900 neurons are signaling at the same time. Usually most of those neurons will not signal at the same time. But what that means is, out of those 900, each of those 900 neurons have a different facet of behavior associated with them or, or a different facet of memory associated with them. And this little neuron that's connected to those 900 is going to, the connection from all those 900 will survive only if, if this neuron is really importantly connected to some of those other 900. So for example, all those 900, they can deal with any and every type of memory that a person has. Okay. But if this particular neuron, if its position in the network has to do with, let's say, um, let's say it has to do with, I'm trying to think of, let's say it has to do with breathing. Okay. Um, and out of all of those 900 neurons, only a small subset are passing signals that have to do with breathing. Okay. Well, if this new, and, 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 and let's say that a few of those other uh, neurons that send input into this neuron also have to do with this this learning that we did from from this exam studying that we did okay so this neuron has two purposes it has a purpose for breathing and also has this new purpose that we forced onto it for this learning of this new topic that this person studied for their exam well this neuron isn't really good at at being used for this learning so through this fitness test what will happen is the connections that it has with other neurons for this learned information will be pruned out. And the connections that it has for its breathing purposes, which is more important in this case, will remain and be strengthened. So that's an example where the um, evolution is acting on the neuron. The neuron itself is doing nothing, and its neighbors are doing nothing to do this. It's simply the activity within the, the way signals flow wow. into this neuron and out of this neuron. That set of connections is what allows this neuron to prune or not prune its, uh, its wonderful. neighbors. Wonderful. So let's, there are a bunch of more questions about pruning. So how does the pruning process work? Is it affected like the, when you are using a lot of, um, you know, cell phones and things like that, the way we use technology, if it is different, does that impact it? 
what is it that optimizes and tunes uh, the, these networks and how does it, you know, what is the root of the optimizing? You know, who is doing the optimizing? How is the optimizing being done? So again, I mean, most of these things that we're talking about, the brain is not actively doing them. Um, it's not like the brain has a section or a segment that, that looks into itself and kind of figures out and analyzes and then fixes things or decides where to prune or decides where to build or decides where to do something. The brain doesn't really have anything like that. A lot of these processes are very low level. They're very autonomous and they're, um, they're driven again by forces like evolution. They're, they're very primitive, simple rules that is um, implemented on a massive, massive scale across this network. Um, so if we're talking about pruning and the same thing, this, most of these rules also apply to learning because pruning and learning is go hand in hand. Um, so if we're talking about pruning, again, it, it really has to do with the, um, the state. So there's another idea that I, one of the slides that I have will go into state. And this is a very important topic. Um, I haven't gone into it yet. I, I presented it in, in some of my earlier talks, but the state of the, of the, of the matrix or the state of the, of the network is an essential idea. In, in neuroscience um, and in, in uh, graph theory and, and, and uh, actually in, in many, many areas. Um, so the state of, of this network um, is one of the main things that determines which parts of it will be pruned and not just the state, this, because the state also transitions. This is another idea that's important to understand is that the brain goes from state to state to state to state. It's always changing. So for example, Earlier, when I gave the example that the prefrontal cortex, you know, we, we decide we want to move our hand up. Okay, that's that's the behavior we, we want to do. And our prefrontal cortex first decides, I want to move. I want to do this, right? It makes a decision. The decision has to be communicated, and eventually it reaches into the motor cortex, which actually sends signals to the muscles to actually cause the hand to rise up. Okay, so there's cascading. So what that means is that the state of the brain early on is that there's simply a decision. And then the decision is communicated to other regions, so the state changes. And then the state changes again, where that decision is then further moved into a more complex behavior. And eventually, the state changes to where it's able to actually start to um, exert energy into the muscles to cause the muscles to fire. So this changing of the state from state to state to state to state is important. And that activity is also part of what uh, I won't use the word decide because it's not a decision. It, 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 the the uh, side effect of these state changes causes pruning to occur or growth or learning to occur. It's, it's the level of activation. So things that are activated frequently with more energy, with more, uh, um, with it's, it's biochemical, it's ionic energy, um, they will remain. And the things that don't have strong energy and activation, reactivation, they're they start to get pruned out. Okay, I want to bring up one more topic and then we can go through slides and then we can come back if there are more questions. Um, are there anything like protective systems within the brain uh, in this network? Uh, or And the second kind of question related to that is when there is damage, how, how does the repair take place? Okay, so um, if I can remember that, I think that the... the um... The original question had to do with damage, but the, the, the answer can be actually answered in more than one way. I mean, the, I'm not aware of any mechanism in the brain where it actually works to rip. Well, so let, let me uh, let me clarify what I'm what I'm saying. The the structure and the functions in the brain. Okay, I'm not aware of any parts of the brain which are there to actually repair parts of, uh, repair the brain um, in terms of the neuronal structure, in terms of the, the wiring map, okay? But when we talk about the glial cells, the glial cells are there to exactly re repair and, and rebuild and actually they, dis they uh, destroy and they consume. Um, you know, when our apoptosis happens, when, when, when a cell goes through, a uh, neuron gets to go through uh, internal cell death. Um, so the glial cells are involved in that. It's not the neuronal cells that are involved in that. I think the person was talking about the network and the neuronal cells. Those, they are not involved in, in repair, as far as I know. 
um, but the glial cells in the support system is. Support system actually also provides a, a second type of immune system, which is separate from our normal immune system. So they do a lot of things supporting. Okay. Um, so, uh, so folks, what I've done is that I've just looked at the major, some of the major general themes that were brought up and those I have put on the table. Uh, so now Sanjay is going to go to through a couple of slides. When we come back, you get a chance to ask one more question, one more time uh, questions. If you want to reiterate your question, you're welcome to do that. Uh, if you have further questions, you're welcome to do that too. So Sanjay, go ahead. Okay, thanks. So let me go back to the slide. Um, so what I want to do, uh, hold on. Okay, so um, what I first want to do is, 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 and this is getting a little more into, into the brain and, and, and what this means as the network. And, and so just in a simple sense, uh, um, this is a very, very, very simple diagram of, of a brain with roughly 20, 25 different uh, dots, circles. Right? And these circles, basically, you could think of as, as individual neurons. Okay. But in graph theory, this, this is really an area of mathematics and, and, and neuroscience. It's, it's, an, it's an emerging area of neuroscience, um, and it's actually part of many, many fields. But these, these circles, these round circles, are known as nodes. Um, these lines that connect them are known as edges. And the number of connections that a single node has to neighboring nodes is known as a degree. So in this case, this blue shows three different lines, so it's connected to three different neighbors. And this bottom left corner, this, this green color shows a connection. So basically, when we were talking about this network map, this is a very simple network map of a brain. It's not a real brain, but it's a very simplified model of a brain, where each of these round circles are a neuron. Each of these uh, lines are an interconnection between the neurons. And what you'll see is that you can kind of roughly say there are regions. So in this bottom left corner, um, there's a region of these five neurons that form a cluster. Okay? They kind of stay together and are connected with each other. And one of these neurons is hyperconnected. It's connected with every other cell in this region, but it's also connected to two other cells outside of itself into the neighboring region. So we can think of this other region. Hopefully my mouse is visible. Is that when I move my mouse, is it visible? Okay. So this other, through the center, this is another region you might say. And then toward the right side, this is the large region here. And then at the bottom of the brain, we have another region here. So this brain, we can think of as having four regions. And they're inter interconnected sparsely. There's not a lot of connections between these regions. But the regions within themselves have a lot of connections. Um, and not every cell is connected to every other cell. Now, this is not actually a real picture of a, of a real brain. Because in this diagram, most of these neurons or most of these nodes are connected with many, many other nodes. In the real brain, um, each of these neurons would only be connected with one or zero of their neighbors. Because as I said, if a neuron has from 10,000 to a million neighbors, and it's only connected to a thousand of those neighbors, it's connected, it's connecting to from 10% down to 0.1% uh, of its neighbors. Okay, So from 0.1% to 10% is, is quite a range, but still the majority of neurons are connected to a very, very small number, you know, 0.1 to 1% range of, of uh, of its neighbors. In this diagram, though, the connections are much, much larger. The percentage-wise is much larger. So in that sense, this is not realistic, but this is there to, to give us a, an understanding of what a network is and the key uh, areas of network. So here in this diagram, we extrapolate these four uh, regions are colorized now, so it's easier to see them. And it's easier to see that there are interconnections between regions in between in the white, region, white space. And also, there's this thing called a connector hub. On the left side, we see this, this connector hub in the purple region, which is, again, hyperconnected. It's connected to every single neuron within that region, but it's also connected to two cells in the blue region. And uh, then uh, you know, we have these between module connect. And in, 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 the, in the language of graph theory, these are not called regions, they're called modules. So between these four modules, or between these four regions, or between connections, which you know this this uh, connection here in the white space shows, and then there are things called provincial hubs. Provincial hubs are basically hubs which are very powerful neurons within a region, 
but they don't connect outside of that region. So in this red region, we see this in the center, this one hub, this one neuron, which connects to almost every other, it, it actually connects, uh, well, it connects almost, it doesn't connect to this one neuron here, but it connects to every other neuron, almost every other neuron in the region, but it doesn't connect to anything outside the region. So it's known as a provincial hub. So there's two types of hubs, a connector hub and a provincial hub, but hubs are important ideas. So these hubs are, so earlier when I gave this example that when a brain starts to develop, these neurons, the first neurons that develop are actually, uh, they later become hubs. Okay? When they first develop, they're kind of, you know, when, when this brain will first develop, this one neuron might be the only neuron in this area. And one, there might be one neuron here, let's say this one, that might be developed. And then this one here might develop. And then this one might. So there might be only four neurons that develop early on when this brain starts to develop. And it, and it doesn't have to match the number of, of uh, regions or the number of modules. It, that's, you know, statistically it might match, it might not match. But, or let's say in this example, there are only three neurons that started at the beginning. And so this one neuron expanded out and it, other neighbors formed and it formed connections and it became this, this purple region. And this neuron blue, it, it, neuron similarly expanded out and it, it, it's not that the neuron splits, it's that other neurons grow nearby and this one neuron, it sends chemical support systems to help other neurons grow. So the support glial cells actually feed its neighboring neurons. So when, when one neuron exists in an area, there's a higher probability that other neurons will grow because the support system, the glial cells, will support other neurons growing there. So over time, those three neurons will grow into these four regions of a lot more than four, four uh, cells. So that, that's these, these are important ideas. And then Third, third slide I want to get into is the, um, and some of these is overlapping, but but um, this this has to do with the types of connections, the fact that there are long distance connections, short distance connections, and this is getting a little bit into the, the small world nature that I described earlier of, of the human brain and a lot of the more sophisticated networks. So in the left side, this, this is an example where this one neuron in the center is a hub neuron. It's connected to pretty much everything else. But it has short connections and it has long connections and mid, mid sized connections. But this one long connection in red is very expensive to build, but it, and it only has one of those. It doesn't have many. You can say that this vertical connection is long, but it's actually shorter than the other. But it, it has very, very few long connections because it is difficult to form and it's also difficult to maintain. Um, so that's one aspect of it. Other, another aspect is that you can have imbalance of connections. So in this case, this deep red. Uh, connection, it may actually be more than one connection, and the, the, this blue may not be necessarily a single neuron, it may be a cluster of neurons. So you may have, let's say, a thousand neurons in this cluster on the left side, and another thousand neurons in the cluster on the right side, and that there are many, many connections between these two clusters. And then on the bottom, we have only a few connections going in the opposite direction from this cluster on the right cluster, there may be only a few going backwards. So these, these form a reciprocal loop, a feedback loop, you can say, but the feedback loop is one directional, it's imbalanced. And that happens often. That This is where the neurons on the left are the driving neurons. So you might say that these neurons on the left are in a prefrontal cortex because our prefrontal cortex does a lot of thinking. And the neurons over here are our motor neurons, which actually control our motor uh, muscles. And they don't have to do thinking, they don't have to do a lot of activity, they're very simple. All they do is they fire at, at our muscles and it might need to basically send a signal back to the to the thinking brain saying, okay, I'm done, right? So you might have very, very few connections going back to this control mechanism here. So this is an example of, you know, what happens. Here's, here's another diagram where this shows more complicated uh, structure, but this is, again, similar to reality where you have a lot of small clusters which have a lot of uh, connections in between um, and, and sparse connection in between regions, very, very few connections between regions. And then this, this uh, uh, last diagram on the right uh, is talking about what are known as a rich club. So um, the, uh, there are two neurons here that are red, and they both happen to be hub neurons. And because they're both hub neurons, they both have a lot of power within their own regions. And if these two neurons are connected, in this case they are because there's a thick red line between them, because these two hubs are connected, they form their own type of club, and it's known as a rich club, where 
th that connection between these two neurons, the connection and the two neurons have magnified power within this brain region or within this brain. These are extremely powerful neurons, or in fact, you know, what, what typically happens is everything that's shown as a dot here is actually a cluster. It's like a cluster of, let's say, thousands or a million neurons. Okay? There will be a cluster here in the cluster. So this cluster of red here and this cluster of red here will have, let's say, let's say you know, 20,000 connections in between them. But these two clusters are a rich club of very powerful neurons within this region of the brain. And this might be a divisional region of the brain. So that's another aspect that's important to understand. Uh, Sanjay, um, can I ask a clarificatory question on the yeah. previous slide? Yeah. Um, so there is directionality, you know, there is the dendrites and there is the axon. Uh, and here in the uh, imbalance connection diagram, the directionality is captured. The other diagrams don't show any directionality. Right. So can you elaborate on that of, you know, why is it that some, some of them, like those, uh, that the other three diagrams don't capture the directionality? Okay, so, so basically when we're talking about a, um, any map or any diagram for, for neural, for, for uh, biological brains, biological neural connections, the connections are always one directional. Okay, every, so every line is basically a one directional line. And for simplicity purposes, we don't show the direction, but in reality to, to make this a useful diagram, you would need to show which direction each connection is going in. So basically a neuron either receives um, for, well, so any connection either sends from, so every connection is, is going from one neuron to the next, and it's never the other way around. Um, so in, in, in this case, this red uh, connection might be going from this external neuron to the center, or it might be going from the center to the external, but it can't be both. It has to be one or the other, meaning that this connection is going out of the center or into the center. That's, that's always the case. Um, another you. aspect that's not covered here, but, but it gets into the, one of the questions that was asked about, um, um, so when we're, uh, let, let, me, let me just think, think about how I'm gonna explain this. Um, the, um, Actually, I think I... the um, when when pruning happens, and, and this has to do with not the damage part of you know because damage damage is not um, regulated or modulated through pruning. It, it, it's 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 usually a biological either disease or, or some other uh, aspect. But when um, when the brain is, uh, one of the things that helps in learning and pruning, learning and pruning go hand in hand. You have to remember that. They're always parallels of each other. Um, the principles that apply to pruning also apply to learning. So one of the things that happens in, in uh, 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 networks, and I didn't show this here, but I did cover this in a previous talk, but I'm gonna, I will raise this again in a future talk, but I want to present this because it's important. Um, and so, taking this imbalanced connection example and think, ignore the fact that it's imbalanced, simply the fact that these two connections are tying back into each other, that's the part I want us to focus on. So this feedback between two neurons is what I'm talking about here, that each of these neurons can affect the other neuron, can affect each other through feedback. And that's a mechanism, and the feedback can be much more complicated where if you have three neurons here, where let's say that you have a third neuron which connects to this neuron only, from this hub on the side, on the left side, connects to this neuron on, on this side. So this, this connection would not have any feedback, but these two neurons would have feedback. So these two neurons with feedback would actually be able to reinforce each other. So the connection between this neuron here might be one direction where it's going out of this external hub from this region out here into this neuron, and that would be infrequent. It would be infrequent signal, which would basically train this one neuron or this cluster to activate. But this neuron, because it's reinforcing, it's able to send reinforcing signals regularly, and then this neuron sends signals back. So they basically reinforce each other. This reinforcement behavior can be a mechanism that allows, um, that prevents pruning, or it allows us to retain learning. 
Okay. So this is a mechanism that if it exists, it can prevent pruning or allow learning. They're both opposite, coin, opposite sides of the same coin. This is, for example, a mechanism that, can, that does exist in our, in our uh, network, um, which helps to uh, strengthen learning or to strengthen pruning. Now, there, now, there's actually two parts to this. It, it gets a little more complicated. These connections that we see, we think, and, and I've mentioned this in the past, but I haven't mentioned it tonight, but these connections are, by default, they're, they're excitatory, meaning this neuron sends a signal to excite its neighbor neuron, and this one might excite back. But there's also another type of signaling, which is called inhibitory. And so if one of these or both of these signaling is inhibitory, that can have the opposite effect. So, it, so instead of this, by default, this network, if both of these are excitatory, they excite and, and give advantage to the other neuron, then this would support each other and it would retain the memory, the, the knowledge between these two neurons. But if one of these is inhibitory, it would break the cycle and it would cause these neurons to, to forget their connection. So that's an important part. We'll, we'll, uh, you know, a lot of these, I, I know we're going to a lot, but I'm going to, I'm going to expand on some of these ideas in later talks. I need to because these are very important ideas. This network is is a foundational, so I will have to expand on a lot of these ideas. But I want to present just a few of these things tonight so that people understand. And in future talks, it, it'll remind you know you of, of, of these ideas. So inhibitory and excitatory is important. Whether they're feedback loops or not is important. Um, whether they are balanced or imbalanced is important. Whether they are hubs or not is important. The fact that every one of these connections is directional is important. These are aspects that, that are very, very essential to, to understand. So I think, um, I don't know if I need to, I, I probably have, have a, few, a few. So yeah, this, this is just a, a su summary of, a, so this is important to understand. This network, these diagrams that I've drawn and, and that you'll see in many places, they are a real rep representation of actual brain, of, of, real, of a brain, of a real brain. Meaning if you see, in a paper, or if you see somewhere a description of a, a, a network map, of, of a map of, of cells, that map is not a hypothetical map. It is not a map of a of a model. It is not a map that is uh, speculative or that's that's hypothesizing something. That map is meant to represent a real network, a real brain, real brain tissue, and so it's trying to show us um, in a simplified way how those, those, that brain tissue is in the real world. So these maps are, re, are uh, images of real things. That's important to understand. They're not, they're not hypothetical models. Um, the network has a status. So the state is an important idea I talked about earlier. I'm going to go a little bit into this right now. And this is the last slide I'm going to go to. I, I know it's, it's you know, a lot of things we've talked about. But the network, the overall network, as well as a subset of the network. Okay, you could think of a subset of the network having a state. You could think of the entire network ha as having a state, right? The state is simply the status, and I'll explain on what that means in, in a minute. So at a, any, any given moment, at any instant in time, the network has a state, and that's important, okay? Um, and the network state changes, and it usually changes in the real world, in the real brain, the state changes frequently. Usually, usually every one to 100 milliseconds, it's changing. And the reason why it's changing is because other neurons from outside are sending signals into it, or it's sending signals into other neurons. Um, so that causes changes in the state. Either signals coming in or signals going out causes changes in the state of this neuron. And what I mean by state, there are three specific things that, that are important to understand. So state is basically a snapshot in time, okay? It's like a photograph, you can say, of this map of, the, of, the, of all the neurons. So one of the things that the state captures that's important to, to know is the wiring between all the neurons, the structure of the, of the network itself. Okay, so for example, if if one of the connections got pruned, uh, sorry, if, if, if one of the connections, if all the connections exist in once in, in the initial state at starting time zero, and then uh, you know 50 milliseconds later, um, a new connection is formed, and then 50 milliseconds even later, one of those connections is pruned out or disappears. Okay, it actually doesn't happen that fast in the real world, but let's say for simplicity's sake that you know in 50 milliseconds a new connection is formed, and another 50 milliseconds a new connection is one of the old connections is gone. Okay, those three snapshots is capturing the wiring between these neur these neurons. So the wiring is changing also. So that's important to understand. The second thing is the interplay between these neurons, meaning 
at any given time, there are actually signals that are moving, there are signals that are in transit between neurons. So it's important to capture that as part of the state. The state, state has to um, encode within itself what are all of the signals and which signals are moving and, where, and are signals in transit between neurons or not. So that's important, signals that are moving between. And then um, the third is the state of each neuron itself. And this is a neuron by itself. So a neuron by itself can be either in a fully charged state, meaning if it's fully charged, it's going to send its energy out into its neighboring neurons in, in, a, in a short amount of time. So it's charged state, whether it's fully uncharged or whether it's somewhere in between charging and the level of charging that. So, so for every single neuron in this, in this matrix, in this uh, network, every neuron has, a, has amount of charge in it. So that information is, is also important. So if you put all this together, in the real world, the state of an entire brain is extremely complicated because you would have between 86 and 100, one, one person asked the question around how many cells do we have in our, how many neurons do we have in our brain? And the answer is both 86 and 100. Somebody, I think, um, uh, Goran uh, tried to answer and he actually found two different answers. The reason is because both those answers are correct. We have 86, we have 100 billion neurons in childhood and 86 billion neurons in adulthood. But so taking a snapshot of 86 billion neurons or 100 billion neurons is almost impossible. And then when you add in the connection between all of those neurons, that becomes even more difficult. And then when you, be, when you add in the state of the charge that's in transit between all of those neurons, it becomes even, so it's overwhelmingly too complicated for us to capture state. So today, we don't capture states of, of real brains. We cannot, it's too complicated. The state that we talk about is um, hypothetical. So if you, if you think of you know, the example that I gave where we make a decision to raise our hand. So hypothetically, the state of our prefrontal cortex would be that a decision is made. We're not talking about every single neuron in the prefrontal cortex and its charging state and the connections. We don't have to go into that level of detail. We're simplifying it and explaining it in a simpler way that the state of the prefrontal cortex is that it's encoding or it's keeping this idea around decision to raise hand. That's a simpler way to, to look at it. But the state is the same thing. In the real world, the state would be a very detailed, as I've explained here. But today, with real brains, we cannot do that. We can, we can do this only with very, very simple or, organisms like C. elegans. It has 300, you know, less than 400 neurons that we can capture a state fully, completely. And, and scientists are doing that today. But with any kind of sophisticated animal, it's, it's almost impossible to do that. So let me stop with the slides there. Um, and then we can go back with any questions. Sure. So firstly, folks, I want to know your level of interest because we are doing this as, you know, as a series, we've been doing it for about a year and we are looking at the next year and we are planning everything. So I want to get uh, Sanjay some feedback about the audience because, you know, we are, you know, ultimately we are doing this for the audience. I want to make sure, you know, and Sanjay wants to make sure that we actually end up communicating. So I have two questions for you. What is your level of interest in neuroscience? And what is your level of knowledge? So you put two numbers. So you can say, and on the scale of four to one. So if your interest is four and knowledge is one, you say four comma one. Uh, if your interest is two and your knowledge is three, then you say two comma three. So go ahead, put those numbers in the chat. So Joe is four one. Keep keep going, folks. Uh, so we got four one, four one, four three, four three. Okay, okay, very good. So the good news I can see very clearly: no point fives. Make up your mind. Uh, no, no, sorry, just kidding. Um, so four. So so this the good news um, is that. There are lots of fours so in terms of interest. Everybody is really interested, tremendously interested, but the level of knowledge is, you know, is quite low. Um, you know, um, and and that's not. I think I think um, so. That's that's the audience, and that's exactly what, you know. In some ways, you should not, you know, beat yourself up because this is a really big field and it's a fast-growing field. And to actually say you know very little is actually going to help you know a lot more. 
So that's a good, good place to start. All right. So um, let's see. Now, there are many ways to go. Uh, Sanjay, what I want to do, it is kind of late. So I do want to get you feedback about what, how things, because many of these folks have been coming and listening to your talks for some time. So I want to just talk briefly, like one minute each with anybody who wants to talk about their impressions about this meetup or these the series of meetups. Um, and I'll just go back and forth very quickly, one minute with each person so that we'll get more things on the table. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So folks, uh, if you would like to talk about what you're getting from the series, because I'm really floored by the fact that there are so many fours in interest. Okay. So let's talk about your interest. Forget about your knowledge for a moment. Uh, talk about why are you interested? Why are you so interested in it? And folks, it's only one minute discussions. I'm going to put timers. Uh, so say something and I will respond. We'll go back and forth very quickly. I want to understand the nature of your interest. So talk because I want Sanjay to have that background for the rest of his meetups of saying, okay, this is what these people are interested in. And then what he will do is that he will match what you actually need to know and what your interests are, okay? So that, that will allow for far more engaging and you will actually, hopefully will move the average of what you know from 1.2 to 1.6, okay, through, through the year. That's uh, in terms of knowledge. And I hope the interest keeps going up as we do that. All right, so let's start with um, Vanessa, Goran, Joe, and Prakash. Vanessa, why are you interested in this? Okay, just a second. I need to unmute everybody. Hold on. Okay, uh, Vanessa, very, very quickly. Why are you interested in neuroscience? Well, one, it affects me uh, personally, but even like, today bringing up the glio cells, maybe a little more information, like can they coax the neurons? Like you can poke a sleeping child and then the child is up to him, like to trigger the circulator or release hormones to protect mm -hmm. the brain. So like mm -hmm. they would tell the neurons, okay, get in, you know, do something, you know, stop Wonderful. the breathing, release the hormones, et cetera. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. Goran, why are you interested in neuroscience? Well, um, I, I studied some psychology, so I, I, I want to know how does psychology work on a little more basic level? Mm -hmm. You know, my feelings, my thoughts, my this and that big questions, who am I, you know, like what's consciousness, uh, what's life, evolutionary, bi biology, psychology, I want to understand the big picture, you know, and, and, and my brain is like very important in understanding that big picture. Wonderful, wonderful, thank you. And I think that's exactly the level at which Sanjay is trying to go to, and he's trying to build up the pieces where, so you have, a you know, as strong a basis as in science and just understanding of facts of what is going on and try to connect it to the higher level. That's what I like about Sanjay's meetups because he does both kind of the science and the experience and kind of the net result of having that. So excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Goran. Uh, next up is Joe followed by Prakash. Folks, go ahead and type an exclamation mark. I, we really want to hear why you're interested so we can tailor these meetups accordingly. Uh, Joe, yeah, I mean, I'm not unlike Goran, uh, where it's more on the behavioral side that I'm thinking about the psychological and the implications it has for how we behave as a society and, mm -hmm. and especially in the area of behavioral economics. So even tonight, mm -hmm. I, you know, the idea of how pruning and uh, I was here a little bit late, but how pruning and, and heuristics could actually work and one work together and with the relationships between those two. So I think that that, you know, really as uh, our decision making and then also how habits are formed and then also the plasticity of the brain is very important as well as understanding how uh, that uh, will, you know, if, if something's damaged or somebody has a stroke, how does the, the, how does the brain redistribute energy and, and heal itself? I find those all very interesting, but specifically the, the psychological and our behavioral uh, as far as how it uh, impacts us and how we participate in an economic uh, behavior. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. It's, it's uh, you know, uh, I, I know that your interests are very large. And I think this meetup 
I mean, the thing I like about Sanjay's series is that we are talking so many about so many things in psychology and in philosophy and social things, and you know, and we're talking about it at an observational level. And what this is is that this is kind of showing you the, you know, how it actually, <laughs> the, the the mechanisms uh, through which it is it is implemented. So wonderful. Um, let's see. Next up is Prakash. Prakash, I know you are new here. So please be brief. Uh, so uh, you know, welcome to the meetups. Uh, go ahead, uh, Prakash. What interests you about neuroscience? So uh, I dabble in uh, AI software programming. So my main interest is in just if I understand this better, I can replicate it with silicon. Got it. Uh, Got it. I, th I think that that's a long ways because we are we don't understand it very well uh, right now. And I think the mostly we are focused tightly on the biological things here uh, for now, because that's what we are trying to kind of get it get it down. So that, that will be our focus. Thank you. Uh, next if, up if is can, going to, go ahead. If I could just add, yeah. I mean, a lot of the ideas that, I mean, after I present the network side of things, I can go into more into the AI side because there are parallels. They're not identical. Um, the brain is much more complicated, but, and, and I have worked in, in areas like that. So I understand um, AI. So we, we will go into, but the, Focus will not be AI. The focus will be right. biological systems, but there are parallels that I might point to sometimes. Sure, um, absolutely. And the thing is that most of the people here are not really focused on AI. So I think, you know, kind of the biological thing, when, if, when we hear all the comments, what I want to do is that I'm going to see the pattern of all the comments to see what, you know, where is the you know, bulk of the interest. Uh, that lies. Um, next up is uh, Laura, Anton, O.C., and Marisa. Laura, what, what interests you about neuroscience? Well, I think it is, you know, sort of a phenomenon of how it functions. Um, I think that we've been going over these things, and each time I understand a little bit better about the how and the why, and, you know, maybe disillusioned a bit about the ability to fix it all, but maybe at the same time, encouraged that there may be ways to get about, you know, maybe a little patch here or there and somehow, you know, when some of these things are charged, you know, maybe we can tweak it somehow that we can make it work right. Because I have a feeling that, I mean, sometimes like, I know in my case, like bad mm -hmm messaging you know maybe if i can fix that tweak that then it'll be better so maybe you'll help me sanjay wonderful thank you thank you we, we are not doctors here okay uh laura but I'm but not, the thing is that you I'm can get a... yeah but 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 what but, but, what what we do is that the the i think i'm partly i think just participating in the meetups does good for your brain Right. Well, okay, that's, that's, that's what that's brain is. Yeah, the beautiful that. thing about the brain, beautiful thing about the brain is that it is adaptive. And the more you put, you know, more you demand of it, the richer the environment it is in, it does a lot more. Yeah. Just being in a richer environment yeah. does wonders uh, for the brain. That's the nature yeah. of the brain. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Um, thank you. Next up is going to be Anton followed by OC. Anton. Yeah, I'm I'm thoroughly enjoying this this entire experience. But I um before I actually joined in, like, and I I assume that I have a very little knowledge of neuroscience, so I, I wasn't sure how much of it I was going to be able to follow. But I a lot of what um Sanjay is saying makes a lot of sense to me, and like people who spoke prior to me, I'm interest. I tend to be interested in broader things, but I'm actually. Uh, pleasantly surprised by how interested I am in the structure or kind of how these neurons function. I didn't know I was going to be as fascinated by it as I am. So uh, yeah, that's what I have to say. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Anton. That was an excellent, excellent comment. Really appreciate that. He's certainly, you know, because it is actually a very complex subject and it was presented very simply. So I think, I think that's, that's absolutely true. And it is, uh, and the, the beauty of it is that even if you are interested at the behavioral level, some very simple things, like for example, everything is networked. Everything is operating through energy flowing through it. It's not like somebody is sitting there trying or parts are sitting there trying to fix things, but there is energy flows uh, in the normal course of life, which is actually shaping the brain uh, in the process. So, so, so some simple ideas like that or the Evo Devo idea, um, it's, it gives you some very simple insights to 
to understand what's going on. Uh, thank you, thank you, Osi. Next, uh, thank you, Anton. Next up is Osi, followed by Maritza. Osi. Yeah, my main interest was AI, but now I understand that's not the focus. But however, I really appreciated the diagrams, the abstract um, models that really helped me understand. So um, my interests now are more um, of how the network grows mm -hmm. and um, what are the dynamics, additional dynamics within the network and um, especially how language, um, difference in languages, for example, form different cultures and if there's a, um, anything um, that you guys could add to that. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Osi. Uh, appreciate that. I just want to clarify my comment about AI. Though we are focused primarily on, uh, you know, suppose you're interested in AI, you still need to understand a lot. The more you understand about the, the biological nature of, of the brain, the better, better you are in a position to deal with AI. Though we are not dealing with it directly, having this background is going to help. Uh, and it can help in a very profound way because the biological systems are enormously are beautiful and they have efficiencies of kinds that are just mind boggling. And many times the, the mechanical systems that we build are good in some things, but they are along some one or two lines. Whereas here, there is so many things happening in so many different dimensions that there is a lot of, lot of uh, inspiration to be gotten from the biological for the creation of, of the mechanical. Thank you, thank you, OC. Uh, next up is uh, Maritza followed by Judy and Madeline. Maritza. She can't, I'm interested in the mechanics. I'm fascinated by the interworkings and the way all the connections work um, and specifically the, um, the concept of how it um, changes evolutionary, evolutionarily and how perhaps we could wield it as a way to improve facets for learning. Yeah, no, I think, I think the evolutionary angle is very powerful. I mean, the simplest thing that I see is that, I mean, one to do that comes out from it is that be careful about the environments in which you are putting your brain in, because that is really going to shape it. You know, don't- and one of the videos touched on that, it was great. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, thank you, thank you, Maritza. Next up is Judy followed by Madeline. Judy. Uh, yeah, um, I'm very interested and the purposeful learning that the brain has. And I, I'm trying to analyze it by doing analogies and how we learn uh, in our daily lives and on how we can learn from the brain to learn how to learn better. And so that's basically, you know, the change, the change process and change by learning and adapting. And I mean, there's so many key words and key words there that also is used in learning. Uh, in the learning technology world. So yeah, I mean, I'm super interested in all this. It's great. Okay, looks like Douglas is having problems asking questions. Uh, Douglas, go ahead. Can you uh, talk about, can you talk briefly about what interests you about neuroscience? You need to unmute yourself. Douglas, can you unmute yourself? I've been trying all night to ask this question. I was eating intelligence of what we're going to do with uh, uh, tumor and brain operations in the in the future to be able to, uh, you know, uh, to do something about somebody that would have a tumor in the brain or a different. Uh, and I want to know what the future looks like. That's what I'm trying to find out. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Douglas. Thank you. Uh, next up. Uh, what we are doing right now is that we are looking at, you know, people's interest in it. So that's the question. I'll put that as a question of, uh, of the level of, uh, of the kinds of interest that, that you have. Uh, next up is going to be uh, Madeline followed by Mike A. Madeline, what interests you about neuroscience? Uh, so much interests me about neuroscience. Uh, it's I thought you would say that. <laughs> I thought it, you would say, what does not interest me in neuroscience? <laughs> Uh, actually, the medical stuff doesn't interest me as much as everything else about it. Mm -hmm. um, I love how complex it is. And one of the big things I've gotten out of Sanjay's uh, sessions, uh, I probably couldn't pass a test on any of it. But as I read articles and think about them, now I have much more of a background for it. 
and I'm able to link the thoughts together um, between one thing and the next. The thing I'm most interested in is um, the evolutionary biology aspect of it, which he did touch upon tonight. Um, I'd love to hear some sessions on, um, one might be like nanoplastics, how they affect our, how their effect on our endocrine system affects our brains and how endocrine system in general affects our brains. Mm -hmm. Another one would be uh, other intelligent animals that have very different nervous systems like an octopus and the speculations on what their consciousness or cognition might be like, or even just what their wiring is like. Um, and also um, more about the nerves in the other parts of our bodies and how those, like how a network in your foot might connect to your brain and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. No, it's, it's, it's really amazing. I mean, I, I like the evolutionary angle very much. Um, I don't remember the name of this organism, but there is an organism, I, Sanjay probably knows it. There is an organism which in the larvae form has a brain, small brain, but it has a brain and it swims around and then it uh, mates. And then once it mates, it turns itself into a barnacle. It sticks to the, uh, sticks to the rock and is fixed. And the first thing it does when it does that, it eats his brain. It eats his brain because it doesn't need it anymore. <laughs> so, uh, so it's really, really fascinating to see, see this at, you know, for, at all levels. Uh, so, so thank you. Uh, next up is going to be uh, Mike. And I'm, I'm sure Madeline, uh, Sanjay, is, Sanjay is keeping track of all, all these things. And I, the, the aim, thing, aim here is to get like the palette of common interest and how people are thinking about it. And that will serve as a background. Um, and, you know, Sanjay, you should still choose the meetups exactly as you're doing, but this will hopefully serve as a, as a background of saying, okay, this is where people are, this is what people are interested in, and somehow, you know, so let, let's continue. Uh, yeah, next this up. Is helping, this is helping tremendously for me. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, thank you, folks. Really appreciate that. Uh, next up is going to be Mike A, followed by Rajin. Mike. I just have a general interest, as always, in the learning process now, focusing more on adult learners. And uh, going forward, I would love to hear a little bit about habit loops, how they're formed, even if you touched on maybe addictive behavior, how that works uh, in the brain. In terms of the mechanics, my knowledge is so low. So anything, any one of these meetups helps me uh, just kind of put the puzzle together. Yeah, and I, I've been impressed by all the people uh, who have been coming to listen to you, Sanjay, because the level of knowledge is there, but they're kind of patiently asking questions and trying to figure things out in their own way. And which is what we are doing. I mean, we are, we are doing this for many, many different topics. And the level of knowledge varies quite a bit for me also for, for on, on, on everything. And it's wonderful to see this. And it is particularly hard in neuroscience because it is so, there's just so much to, to take in and uh, how, and the rate at which it is growing. Next up is Rojin. Rojin, what interests you uh, on neuroscience? Um, most of my education and background and experience has been about predicting the behavior of groups of people, um, which without a lot of success, um, at best, it, it doesn't, we don't predict very well. And this is making it very concrete for me about why people are so different, how they're so complex. And it's like, of course, you know, statistical regressions and things are really not gonna be enough of an answer to predict things at the depth that I would like to. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Rojin, appreciate that. So Sanjay, you've heard from uh, everybody about what, you know, many, many, many folks about what their interests are. Uh, would you like to come in? You don't have to address any of those interests right now, but what is what has been your experience hearing about these? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a broad range, um, which I liked. Um, also, there, there are certain um, threads, common threads that I, that I heard from several people mention. 
um, which which uh, I I think is important because that that will hold the discussion together. You know, if, if several people have um, similar interests, you know, their questions will will have meaning to other people also. That's important in this. Um, and I think the um, just the the uh, the periphery of the range of of interests um, helps me to to understand the extent of what people are curious about relative to neuroscience. You know, if, for example, um, Madeline talked about specific areas. Joe talked about specific areas. Um, Prakashan and uh, I forget some. Uh, Oh, see. Two or three people talked about AI, yeah, mm -hmm. and and so the, these these uh, you know what what one of the things that I try to do when I when I talk about a topic is you know I, I there's flexibility in the examples I could choose so I might now choose examples that are specific to some of their interests rather than just general examples that are more uh, you know mainstream so you know it it, it helps me to to uh, make the, uh, the discussion more uh, enjoyable for everyone. Wonderful. Um, Excellent. Uh, thank you. I, 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 thought, I thought it worked uh, pretty well because I think, um, you know, ultimately the, the real value of these meetups is the community and with the whole group of people trying to learn, asking questions. And that is the primary value so kind of hearing from people periodically about exactly where they are, what their interests are, um, I think I think is very, very helpful. So thank you folks. Um, and uh, go ahead. One, 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 yeah, just quick, very quickly. One, one thing I wanna just, this is a little bit of hope because this is a very difficult topic and, and tonight you know, was, was a very detailed, actually I didn't go to a lot of detail, but there was a lot of information presented because there's so much more behind it that I, think is important for people to understand. So one thing to, to remember is you know, just as like when we were all children and we had to remember, we had to learn the, the multiplication table. There's no way to learn the multiplication table other than to memorize it, other than wrote over and over and over and over. And that's one of the techniques I use in this is that I present the same idea in one presentation, then you know a few times later, you know, a few sessions later, I'll present it again. So I present it over multiple sessions. That's one aspect. And that's important because that you'll learn using that method. That's fundamental to our learning. We can't learn something if we just see it once. It's rare for people to learn that way. So recognize that this is difficult, um, but it will take time and, and I'm trying to help everyone along. My goal is to have a community which really understands us so that we can go to higher levels and talk about more complicated things. Wonderful. So the breakout um, sessions in the past, we've done that. So I want that to be on a larger scale. Absolutely. Um, Joe, can you do me a favor? Can you put the uh, playlist for uh, the neuroscience in, uh, in the chat? Folks, let me tell you about what's coming up next Wednesday. Um, I'm going to do a meetup that is going to try because uh, next Wednesday, which is again, Comprehensivist Wednesdays, where we try to connect different fields. I'm going to try to connect up the four other days that we have been spending. So I'm going to be doing a meetup on what is the commonality what commonalities and differences do you see between the Bible, Tao Te Ching, Bhagavad Gita, and the design way? So those four things that we've been studying, maybe we'll include Louis Sullivan in there. We can include other people of seeing, you know, what are the common ideas that are there and what are the differences that you see? So that would be a great example of comprehensivist thinking and it's going to be crowdsourced. So I will have some comments, but I look forward to your thoughts, especially those who have been um, participating in many of these meetups. But even if you have not been participating in these meetups, uh, you're welcome to, even if you know one of these areas, or if you're just curious about what is the connections between these three different you know, religious texts and one design text two design texts, actually. I'm going to put Louis Sullivan in there. So two architects, maybe I, I can make three architects and three religions. I can call it that. Three religions and three architects. We'll go for, um, of course, uh, Buckminster Fuller, uh, Harold Nelson of the Design Way, and Louis Sullivan on one hand, and then the religious texts on the other hand. What are the commonalities between 
all of these between these two groups. Uh, so that's what we're going to be exploring next Wednesday. Uh, so look forward to seeing you there. Um, thank you very much, everybody. Bye. And Sanjay, always an honor. This is just amazing. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, thank thanks. you, Sanjay. Uh, thank you, Sanjay. Thanks, Sukhan. Thank you. Bye.